Good evening. It's a delight to be with you. Uh, last year I started this uh, whole series responding to the 20 top myths, old and new, about the Catholic Church. And I did it because, you know, some of these myths are just accepted hands down by the world around us. And we often just kind of get sucked into it. Well, I guess that's right. And I want to kind of highlight some of these myths. And uh, so last year I began it, and I did three of the myths. I did the first one, religion, in particular Catholicism, is the number one cause of violence and war in the history of the world. Number two, the Catholic Church has declared a war on woman is anti-woman and misogynistic. We've heard those just very much recently, you know, in the political debates. Number three, the Crusades were medieval crimes against humanity, a prime example of destructive religious zealotry. By the way, next week, if you come next week, I'll have a copy of those first three here for you so you can take it. And then at the end of this, you can get copies of this session. <clears throat> Tonight, I'd like to be, uh, in the second session, I'd like to talk about two more myths. I cut it down because it was a little bit too much three in one night. So we're going to do two tonight, two next Monday. First myth we're going to talk about is myth number four. Catholicism specifically, and Christianity generally, is derived from paganism. Just recycled, rehashed pagan myths. And the fifth myth will be that the Middle Ages was just one long dark age of ignorance and superstition Relieved only by the advent of the Renaissance, the Enlightenment, rationalism, and modernism. So let's get started with the first one. The Catholicism is just uh, rehashed paganism. You know, not many people in our modern society really know secular history, and even fewer have a knowledge of an appreciation of Catholic history. So they become easy prey for purveyors of fanciful histories and myths, particularly the claim that Catholicism in specific, Christianity in general, is derived from paganism. It's just recycled pagan myths. Anti-Catholic Christ critics, including many modern secularists, they often suggest that the Catholic Church did get the truth in the beginning. But when the Edict of Milan happened, when Constantine issued that in 313, allowing Christianity to be legal, then everything began to change. Because once the church opened the doors, then all these pagan influences started to come into the church and it began to corrupt the church. You know, drawing from the title of Martin Luther book, it was called The Great Babylonian Captivity. And as I said, they said, okay, the church had the truth, but with the Edict of Milan, it lost the truth. It was influenced by paganism. 
And the truth was only rediscovered by the Protestant reformers. Now the problem with this theory is that one needs to prove that the Catholic Church taught something different before the Edict of Milan than what was taught afterwards. And there is no such proof. In fact, the opposite is true. We have a consistent history, a documented history, that the church has taught the same thing all the way through, even to this present day. But the opponents of the Catholic Church, both secular and some Christian denominations, they try to prove this theory by attempting to show similarities between Catholicism, its beliefs and practices, and beliefs and practices of ancient pagan cultures and religions. This fallacy is often committed by certain Christian fundamentalists against Roman Catholics, Seventh-day Adventists, uh, Jehovah Witnesses, and Mormons. We're thrown in with those because uh, fundamentalist Christians believe that we are also a cult, as they call those groups a cult. Other fundamental Christians commit this fallacy against not only Roman Catholics, but also uh, mainstream Protestants. And atheists and skeptics, they often commit this uh, fallacy, promote this myth against both Christians and Jewish people. Where did it all come from? Well, the 19th century witnessed a real flowering of this, what I call, pagan influence, myth, or fallacy. It was that era which saw some publications of books. For example, The Two Babylons by Alexander Hyssop. That book is the classic English text that charges that the Catholic Church derived itself from paganism. And it paid the way, as that book paid the way for generations of antagonism against the church. Also during that very same time, you know history, in the 1800s, new sects developed, such as Seventh-day Adventist, Mormons, and Jehovah Witness. And all these consider traditional Catholicism and mainstream Protestantism as polluted by paganism. If they have the truth, they don't. Also, that era saw the rise of atheistic free thinkers like Robert Ingersoll. He began writing books attacking the Catholic faith and Judaism claiming that they were pagan. This pagan influence myth has not gone away in the 20th century, but thanks be to God, new archeological finds and discoveries and more mature scholarship, it's it's diminished its influence. Yet, there's a whole lot of people out there propagating this myth, both even family members, friends, uh, often in the media. For example, in in Protestant circles, numerous works have continued to popularize the claims of Alexander Hyssop, most notably things like Lorraine Bettner's Roman Catholicism. If you didn't know it, Lorraine Bettner's Roman Catholicism is the Bible, the source book of all anti-Catholic claims. Uh, When I first arrived here, someone uh, came up to me and gave me this list of questions said, Father, this was on the website of, of, of uh, uh, Cornerstone Church, a letter written to all my Catholic brothers and sisters asking these following questions or making these charges. What do you think about that? And I said, I, what I think is you go right to the book, Lorraine Bettner's Roman Catholicism, and it's right there. He took that right from the book. And the problem is that with that book, It makes hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of claims, but gives zero footnotes. You can make any claim in the world you want, but you don't back it up with any footnotes, historical footnotes. Uh, Very few people know whether it's true or not. Uh, Things like uh, the comic books of Jack Chick. Do you remember those at all? Boy, I remember when I was a newly ordained priest, constantly... On Sunday Mass, I go out there and all these little comic books have been put on the window shields of all the cars in our parking lot. They had someone going out. Jack Chick is up in uh, kind of in the Santa Clarita area, just north of the San Fernando Valley. He has a center there. And they're cartoon comic books that make all these claims. Uh, another book would be written by Ralph Woodrow called The Babylon Mystery Religions. 
again, regurgitating the same uh, claims that Alexander Hyssop had made. Now, I should say this, that later on, Ralph Woodrow, he realized his flaws, and he wrote a second book called The Babylon Connection. And in this second book, he repudiated what he said in the first book. And he absolutely refuted Alexander Hyssop's uh, uh, claims. But as you well know, once a book is out, the first book is often quoted, not the second. Other Christian and quasi-Christian sects have continued uh, to charge mainstream Christianity with paganism. And many atheists have continued to repeat those same claims, literally unquestioned. That's why I'm teaching this course. People kind of hear this stuff and they go, well, I guess it's true. No, it's not true, but you need some information. Huh? These charges have been made and repeated for a couple centuries now. For example, Alexander Hislop and Jack Chick, they argue that the hosts that we use in Catholic communion are round, just like the wafer hosts of the sun worshippers of Baal. Well, what they both don't bother to mention is that the wafers used by the pagans were also ovals, triangles, some with edges folded over, others shaped like animals or leaves. This is the fact that something is oval does not make it immoral, wrong, or pagan. Since even the Jews, you know, they had circular wafers <clears throat> and, cotton and cakes <clears throat> excuse me, that they offered in the Old Testament. So those arguments presented by these more modern critics, uh, Jack Chick and uh, Hyssop and stuff, they just fall flat, and they actually backfire against them. Often, you know, if you go to their books like this, you open them up and they have illustrations, and you'll see drawings of ancient priests with headdresses on that appear on one, some of them are like little beehive headdresses, and others are kind of pointed like this, So they'll picture that picture there, and then they'll show a picture of the Pope wearing a tiara. Remember the Pope used to wear a triple crown? It was called a tiara to represent the three faculties of the Pope, to teach, to rule, to sanctify. They don't wear it anymore because it's pretty pompous, but you can see them in the Vatican Museum. Or the bishops, they they wear the mitre. And so they'll juxtapose these pictures and say, see, look at this did it. The Pope wears something like that. The bishop, this, these priests did it. The bishops wear it. They must be pagan. Some atheists will take the pagan connection even one step further, saying <clears throat> that Christianity is just a regurgitation of pagan myths. And they go citing many things from pagan religions. Things like that the Christians believe in the incarnation, the dogma of the incarnation. That the Son of God became man, born of the Virgin Mary. The Christian belief of a divinity born of a virgin, a venerated mother and child, they say is just like Isis and Osiris of the Egyptians, or Isa and Iswara, or Fortuna and Jupiter, and Semiramis and Tammuz in the pagan religions and cultures. Some pagan religions had a triune God, and these gods were often pictured with wings, just as God is verbally pictured in the Psalm 91, verse 4, with wings. The flames on the head of the apostles were also seen as an omen of the gods in Roman poetry and in heathen myths long before Pentecost ever happened to the Christian church. So because it was there, here it is again. A rock stuck, struck by uh, Moses, Numbers 20, verse 11. Remember, he struck the rock and water came out? Well, it's just what the goddess Rhea did long before Moses. Also, a Jesus, identified by a Christian icon or iconography. One of them is the fish. Have you ever seen that on the back of cars, the, the fish? Where does that come from? Well... The Greek word for fish is ichthus, and it was used as an acronym for the early Christian church. Each letter of the word ichthus stands for a word, and the five letters stand for Jesus Christ, Son of God, Savior. But because it's 
the word fish, and then he had the symbol of it, they say, see, that's just like the fish god Dagon. Also, atheists will quote uh, Mercia Eliad, who wrote a wonderful book called The History of Religion, saying that many of the themes present in Christianity, well, those themes and myths were part of, uh, or those themes were part of myths and rituals of the ancient pagan world. And Eliad, Merced, uh, Merced Eliad lists a lot of them. A God descended to take you incarnate form. A God became man. A God battled with powers of darkness. A God descended into the underworld to redeem the dead. A God is brought back to life in the springtime of the year. A king is sacrificed to atone for the sins of the people. A God ascends back into heaven. An innocent warrior is sacrificed. A scapegoated victim. See, when these atheists see these parallels or these somewhat similarities, what they end up saying, well, you see, Christianity is merely paganism warmed up. All those ancient myths are simply just swept up, rehashed, mashed together with added spices and forced into Christianity, kind of like making a sausage. And just as we no longer believe in Ishtar and Moloch or Odin and Zeus, well, we no longer need to believe in that other mythical hero, Jesus Christ. Now, here's the problem. The problem is that these claims by fundamentalist Christians as well as uh, certain sects and by atheists, the fact of the matter is these claims are shot through and through with all kinds of fallacies of logic and historical inaccuracies. Now, fortunately, like the attacks on Catholicism in particular, all of the supposed parallels or similarities mentioned, that I just mentioned, they really self-destruct when examined with some kind of scholarly rigor. And that's what we must do is have this kind of rigor to know things so we can challenge it. If these uh, claims are not guilty of historical inaccuracies, all of them are certainly guilty of what we can call the pagan influence fallacy. What do I mean by that? What I mean is by this is that anything can be attacked using the pagan influence fallacy or its derivative. In other words, something we do today, you could find that experience in the past. For example, that you use in uh, rings, you exchange rings when you get married. That's been used in many cultures in the past. So, ah, you see, Catholics are pagan because they, or you dress in a white dress. How many women here got married in a white dress here? Well, you're pagan. Because a pagan did that. See, it doesn't necessarily, the connection just because it happened doesn't mean it is. The pagan influence fallacy is committed when one charges that a particular religion or a particular belief or practice is of pagan origin or has been influenced by paganism and therefore it's false, wrong, tainted, and it has to be repudiated. Just because a pagan did something doesn't make it false. The pagans used to give a ring as a reminder of the love that was committed one to the other, the sign of an eternal love. There's nothing wrong with that. Now, that happens to coincide with our own belief as Christians, but there's nothing wrong with that, you see. Now, in its minimal form, the pagan influence fallacy is really a subcase of what we call the genetic fallacy. A genetic fallacy improperly judges a thing based on its history of origin rather than on its merits. I'll give you an example of that. No one should use this particular medicine like penicillin because it was invented by a drunkard or an adulterer. Well, it doesn't matter what it was invented. Is it good in itself? Of course. So it's not discounted. But you use these claims, you have to then just discount that. Now, very frequently, the pagan influence fallacy is committed in connection with other fallacies of logic. You know, that was one of the courses we took in the seminary. And I'm really glad because logic teaches you to think reasonably, orderly, huh? And one of the uh, pagan influence fallacies, or one of the fallacies of logic that the pagan influence fallacy commits is what we call post hoc ergo propter hoc, or propter hoc. Post hoc, after this, 
therefore, because of it. Does that make sense? Because of the, 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 after the event, therefore, it's because of the event. Well, there's a lot of uh, fallacy with that. Post hoc ergo propter hoc. Some ancient pagans did or believed something millennia ago. Therefore, any similar Christian practice and belief, if it's like it, well, obviously that must be derived from the source. That's a fallacy of logic, you see. Now, a variation of that fallacy is often committed in which as soon as a similarity or uh, parallel with something pagan is noted, it's assumed also that the pagan counterpart is the more ancient one. A variation of that could be called the uh, similis hoc ergo propter hoc. Similar to these are Latin phrases. Similar to this, therefore because of this. Again, I'll give you that example. The picture that you see sometimes in these uh, fundamentalist books showing a a priest of a pagan religion wearing a beehive kind of headdress then showing a pope wearing in the old pictures, like old times, the tiara, the triple tiara. Ah, like it? Therefore, it is it. It's a fallacy. Now, when the pagan influence fallacy is met, what you need to do is point out, that's a fallacy. It's not right thinking. Now, to help to clarify that to a religious person, let's say it's a fundamentalist challenging with it, When a fundamentalist commits this pagan influence, it might be helpful to illustrate with cases where the pagan influence fallacy could even be committed against his own position. For example, the practice of circumcision was practiced in the ancient world by a number of ancient people, including the Egyptians. But you know, there are few Jewish people or Christians who would say that it's divinely authorized use in Israel was an example of pagan corruption. Or, how about this, showing a ancient pagan priest holding a book and then showing an additional picture right next to it, juxtaposing them, showing a Christian minister holding a Bible, say, hey, they look similar, therefore they are the same. So the Bible came from a pagan origin. See, that's how it turns back on them, if you don't think it through logically. To help a secular, like an atheist, to see the fallacy involved, you can point to a parallel case of the genetic genetic fallacy involving his own belief and perspective. For example, when they say that, post hoc, ergo, propter hoc, or looks like it, therefore it is the same, you say, well, you know, how about this? Someone shouldn't accept this particular scientific fact or theory because it was developed by an atheist. It falls apart. So whenever you encounter a proposed example of pagan influence, number one thing you must do is demand that its existence be properly documented, not just asserted. See, the danger of accepting an inaccurate claim, it's too great. You know, it's just too great. There's a lot of misinformation. And it's advisable that if you hear something like this, Ask for the documentation from a primary source, not just, well, uh, I read it somewhere. No, show me the documentation. I'll tell you where I, I really learned my lesson in this. Once I gave a whole sermon, a beautiful thing, it was kind of, I think, on the transfiguration. But I read a story on the Internet about this guy, and it turned out they said it was Mel Gibson. He had a very terrible action, and then this gracious man provided things. And he had plastic surgery, and he came out looking like he did. I based my whole sermon on that, and then all of a sudden, someone showed me that it was, it was all make-believe. I should have gone to Snopes, checked it out. You know, just because it's on the Internet doesn't make it true. You need to check things out before you use something, because there's a lot of information out there. And then, after receiving the documentation supposedly supporting a claim of a pagan similarity between our beliefs and something in the past in a pagan culture, you should also ask a number of questions. Number one, is there a parallel? Is there a similarity? You know, frequently there is not. You know, they, they, they make a claim, but there's no, there is no similarity. The claim of being a parallel or similarity may be very erroneous, especially when 
the documentation provided is really something old or undisclosed. As I mentioned, Lorraine Bettner writes a whole book and maybe has four footnotes for the hundreds and hundreds of claims he makes, maybe four. And even those I don't think are accurate. Robert Ingersoll, the famous atheist of the 19th century who wrote the book, Why I Am an Agnostic, he stated, the Egyptians had a trinity. They worshiped Osiris, Isis, and Horus thousands of years before the Christians believed and worshiped the triune God, the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's written there. But brothers and sisters, that ain't true. The Egyptians had an Ennead, a pantheon of nine major gods and goddesses. Osiris, Isis, and Horus were simply three divinities in that pantheon who were closely related by marriage and blood, and they also figured in the same myth cycle. But they didn't represent the three persons, one in God, the teaching of the Trinity. So the claim of an Egyptian Trinity, it's just simply wrong. There is no parallel. There is no similarity. Another, the second question you should ask, is the parallel dependent or independent? See, even if there is a pagan similarity, that doesn't mean that there is a connection between them, a cause between them, that one caused the other. For example, two groups may develop similar beliefs and practices and artifacts totally independent of each other. You know, the idea that similar forms are always the result of the diffusion from one common source, that has been long rejected by archaeology and anthropology, and for very good reasons. You see, humans are similar and live in similar kinds of environments leading them to have similar kinds of artifacts and tools and beliefs and views. For example, if you read a lot of fundamentalists, I used to do a study on fundamentalist Christianity so I could respond because I used to get all these questions thrown at me. But fundamentalists had made a huge uh, uproar about the fact that Catholic art includes the Madonna and child, Mary and the baby Jesus. And look, non-Catholic pagan art all over the world also includes mother and child images. Well, there's nothing sinister in that, brothers and sisters. I'll tell you why. The fact is, in every culture, there are mothers who hold children. Just look at it. Go to the National Geographic. You don't have to go around the world. Just see it there. They hold children. And sometimes this gets represented in art, including religious art, And it especially is used when the work of art is being done to show, for example, the motherhood of some individual. So mother and child images do not need to be explained by a theory of diffusion that it came from a common pagan religious source, as Alexander Hislop suggests when he says in his book that it's just like the representations in art of Semiramis holding Tammuz, the child. See, one needs to look no further than the fact that mothers holding children is a universal feature of human experience, and it's a convenient way for artists to represent motherhood. So, is the parallel dependent or independent? It's important to ask that. Number three, is the parallel antecedent or consequent? Is it before it or after it? See, even if their pagan parallel is causally related to a non-pagan counterpart, this doesn't establish what gave rise to the other. It may be that the pagan parallel is a late borrowing from the non-pagan or the Christian source. You know, pagan sources are so late that they often have been shaped in response to the Jewish and the Christian religions. That happens all the time. For example, you know, in the Bible, the, the the list of the Bibles, uh, the books in the Old Testament. You know, we Catholics believe there's 46 books in the Old Testament. Christians and Jewish people have 39 in the Old Testament. And the reason is, we took the list of books from the ancient uh, list called the Alexandrian uh, list. And they, they, in reaction to the Christians... The Jewish people, after the, uh, Israel and Jerusalem was destroyed and the temple was destroyed, 
they set up a criteria and set up what really makes up the Old Testament. The Christians took the, the uh, Septuagint, which had been used for three or four hundred years before Christ, or two hundred years before Christ. They took it and they used it. It was only after the fact that the Jewish people set up their list. So it was in response to the Christian church that the Jewish list or the Hebrew canon came out. So is it before or after? Uh, sometimes it's possible to tell that pagans have been borrowing from non-pagans, like Christians. Other times it can't be discerned who's borrowing from whom, or if anyone is borrowing from anyone else. For example, you know, H.A. Gruder, in his book, The Norseman, he states that the ideas expressed in the Norse elder Ada about the end and the regeneration of the world were probably influenced by the teachings of Christians with whom the Norsemen were in contact for many ways because it was a later publication. But if you didn't know history, you'd say, oh, there it is again. Christians are borrowing from the pagans. There it is. No, you've got to know whether it's before or after and is there a connection between them. Number four question, is the parallel, the similarity treated positively, neutrally, or negatively? See, even if there is a pagan similarity to us, that doesn't mean that the item or the concept was enthusiastically or uncritically accepted by us because something happened over there. doesn't mean we accept it. See, we have to ask, how did they regard it? Did they regard it as something positive or neutral or negative? Let me give you an example of that again. Circumcision might be termed a neutral Jewish counterpart to a pagan parallel. See, it's quite likely that the early Hebrews first encountered the idea of circumcision among neighboring non-Jewish people. But that doesn't mean they regarded it as a religiously good thing for non-Jews to do. Circumcision was regarded as a religiously good thing only for Jews because for them it symbolized what? The special covenant that God established with his people. We see that in Genesis 17. The Hebrew scriptures are silent in the religious appraisal of non-Jewish circumcision. They seemed indifferent to the fact that some pagan people around them circumcised their children. Oh, how about for us in the Christian faith? The symbol of the cross. It might be termed or seen as a neutral Christian counterpart to a pagan similarity. The early Christians who adopted uh, the cross as a symbol, they didn't do so because it was a pagan symbol. See, the pagans used that symbol, notably in East Asia, also in the Americas, but they had no influence on the Christian outlook or belief. The cross was used as a Christian symbol because why? Jesus died on the cross. His execution, which was regarded as a very bad thing, the worst thing that ever happened to the world, the total most infinite injustice, but it was one which brought about eternal life for the world. So Christians didn't adopt it because the pagan world had it. adopted it because they believed this was the very essence of our faith. An example of a negative parallel or similarity can be found in the Genesis account of the flood. You know, the flood narrative in Genesis 6 to 9, chapter 6 to 9, it does have parallels to pagan flood stories. And you often hear this said. I've heard it many times. Oh, this, it was there, and they just stole it from them and just kind of made a little changes here. That No. Because why? Because the, the, revel, revel, the divine revelation in Genesis refutes many of the ideas in the other one. The Genesis story of the flood attributes the flood to what? Human sin. Not to overpopulation as... Athrahais in the epic and Greek, the Greek poem Cypria did. The presence of, of flood stories in cultures around the world, it doesn't undermine, discount, or paganize the biblical narrative. In fact, it adds credence to it. Another area where we can see this criticism, refutation, and replacement are also the principles behind uh, modern holidays being celebrated. Uh, to a limited extent around the same time as former uh, pagan holidays. You hear this all the time, you know. 
I hear that, in fact, every time we come to Christmas, you hear this pagan fallacy. Oh, what the Christians did is they simply took the uh, feast of Saturnalia and they simply Christianized it. You know, it's the same thing. No, there's a lot of difference to it. I'm sorry. In actuality, the reports of uh, Christmas, it doesn't occur on Saturn, uh, Saturnalia. However, to the extent that the phenomenon occurs at all, Christian holidays were introduced to provide what? A wholesome, non-pagan, alternative celebration, which critiques and often rejects that Christian pagan holiday. You know, the, the pagans used to believe uh, that the sun god rose, you know, at, at Christmas right at the winter solstice when the sun is lowest in the sky. And the pagans used to believe, oh my gosh, if we don't worship and do wild uh, rituals and coax that sun back up, we're going to die because the sun brings life. And the Christian ministry said, that's not a God. The true God is Jesus Christ. He was the light of the world. He was born to our world to dispel the darkness. And he came to give us life. You're worshiping the wrong God. They refuted it, huh? In order to evangelize non-believers or pagans, Christian missionaries would often appropriate things familiar to the pagans or to the non-Christian world. And in sense, they baptized them, giving a whole new Christian meaning. Uh, you see that a lot when they take pagan springs or wells and they change the name of it. They give it a whole new teaching. By the way, you know, a fundamentalists often criticize the Catholic Church with paganism by using these examples. But you can turn it right back and say, well, if they're offended by that, then guess what? They need to be offended by, uh, for example, Halloween. They're always offended by Halloween. Uh, that's a pagan thing derived. They stole it right from paganism. Halloween actually means the eve of all hollows. The eve of the feast of, the, of all saints. And it was put on top of it to counteract what the pagans believed, that, that these evil spirits would wander around at that night. And so you put on masks uh, to confuse the spirits so you wouldn't be attacked by them. The church put an eve of all hollows, Halloween, to counteract that. But the fundamentalists have done the same thing. They have, in, in place of Halloween... What do they do? They put an alternative thing called Reformation Day, which uh, they celebrate with their children. The modern Protestant holiday of Reformation Day, it was based on the fact that the Reformation began when, when Martin Luther not, uh, put on the Church of Wittenberg 95 Thesis. What day did he do it on? October 31st, huh? 1517. And so they have a feast of Reformation Day. But I say, hey, you did the very same thing. You took a feast that was pagan and you made it Christian. But now if you use your reasoning, you're guilty. You've fallen into the, uh, the, the paganism. We don't believe that, but you could turn back on them. Another uh, fundamentalist substitute for Halloween uh, has been these harvest festivals that celebrate the season of autumn and the gatherings of the cross. The fact is, the fundamentalist Christian substitutions what was pagan with their own kinds of holidays, as the Christian church has done, they're no more pagan than the celebrations of days or seasons that may have been introduced by earlier Christians. No. So ultimately, all attempts to prove that Christianity in general, Catholicism in specifically, is derived from paganism, it just falls flat in its face. Catholic doctrines are neither borrowed from the mystery religions nor introduced from pagans after the conversion of Constantine and the passing of the Edict of Milan. See, to make that charge of paganism stick, one must have to be able to show more than a similarity between something in the church and something in the non-Christian world. And one must be able to demonstrate a legitimate connection between the two, showing clearly that one is a result of the other and there's something wrong with a non-Christian item. See, it's not just say that there's something that looks like it, appears like it, or maybe he was borrowed from it. But was it wrong? You know, the presumption is the pagans didn't have any truth. That's not true. They had reason. They could reason to things. Certain things were true. Wedding rings, white clothes for weddings. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that. So in the final analysis, nobody has been able to prove that these things regard uh, the things of the myth or the claims of the myth regarding doctrines of the church, beliefs, or practices in the Catholic faith, uh, that they are myths, that they're drawn from paganism. 
So the charge of paganism, brothers and sisters, it just doesn't work. It's just that, a lie and a myth. Let's go to the second one. Myth number five. The Middle Ages were one long, dark age of ignorance and superstition, relieved only by the advent of the Great Renaissance and later by the succeeding movements of the Enlightenment, Rationalism, and Modernism. Brothers and sisters, there is little in our modern life that is more muddle-headed than the view that the people, uh, that most people have of the Middle Ages. You know, but over and over again, you see this mentality on display in every corner of life. For example, 15 years ago, a professor from a prestigious university here in California was on video. It was one of a series of films made for remote learning to other colleges. It was also shown on TV. It was on the Middle Ages. The lectures were illustrated, and for the medieval section, most of the pictures were very dark and grotesque to reinforce the idea that the Middle Ages were the Dark Ages. Remember that we used to say that? The Middle Ages, they were the Dark Ages. And the professor even made the comment that in the Middle Ages, when the sun went down, it got dark outside. And he then showed a picture of a very dark village on the screen. Well, guess what? For a long period of time, when it got dark outside, everything was dark, huh? And then when he got to the medieval people, he repeatedly referred to them as the awkwardness of their minds. They were so awkward that they built buildings that fell down. And on the building, he saw a picture of a building that was dilapidated, but actually the building that was being falling down was from a totally different period than the uh, Middle Ages. It was crumbling down. Well, a lot of buildings crumble. You see that all the time. In passing, the professor happened to mention that the period, the period of the Middle Ages had produced the Gothic cathedrals and that their foundations literally went down uh, to the depth of a subway station and the spires rose hundreds of feet in the air. But then he asked on the film, how, if their minds were so awkward, could medieval people produce such beauty? You know what his answer was? to compensate for their awkwardness of their minds. And then he goes on to say that uh, we must not forget that these very awkward, ignorant people rarely knew what time it was since the sundials could not work in the dark ages. I, I, apparently this professor had never heard of water clocks that were well in use during the Middle Ages. And needless to say, he made absolutely no mention of people like St. Thomas Aquinas, Roger Bacon, St. Bonaventure, Duns Scotus, or any other reasonably bright uh, medieval thinker. This anti-medieval prejudice, it's built into our culture, especially by the uninformed or sometimes the prejudiced media, and especially uh, from our equally uninformed school system. I don't want to say, say it's true for everybody, but, you know, generically, it, a lot of times you see that. I was talking to my sister, and she was uh, listening. She's in a quilt-making group. And the table over, she was hearing these people regurgitate these wild claims that Western civilization destroyed the beautiful culture here in the Western, in the United States, in the Americas, you know, deliberately bringing over these diseases so they could destroy the people. My sister listened to this for a while, and she's a very bright young lady. She walked over and says, excuse me, I, I, I just overheard this, and I have to tell you that that is absolutely ridiculous. No one knew at the time when the Columbus and the succeeding explorers came over. No one knew about bacteriology and germs. They didn't know about it. Unwittingly, they did bring things like smallpox that did hurt the people, but they didn't do it deliberately. They just didn't know. If you want to make that claim, then how about going back to the 13th century when the Black Plague, the bubonic plague, are you going to go and say and blame China because the, the disease began in China and it came over with the rats and the ship and they got out into Europe and it spread? But we don't say those people 
did it deliberately. No, it's just a fact. But that kind of stuff, the, one of the people, the person was saying it, it happened to be a teacher in a high school, and I, I worry about what are they saying to these young people who will hear some of it and then just start kind of uh, moving along with it. It's, so it's not only our school system, it's also in our media. You know, not long ago, I heard a reporter covering a civil war in another country, and he formed all of us listeners that, uh, that the participants exe- exhibited medieval barbarism. Often you hear sometimes a discussion of bizarre cult, which will include references to medieval superstitions. The phrase medieval torture is often used to describe really bad atrocities. I've heard this many times. Often, uh, even you'll see in commercials, you know, companies are trying to sell a new product, whether it's a car, a computer, or endless other things. And that new product is often contrasted with the images of dark monastery halls with line of cowled monks carrying guttering candles. In the background, you hear Gregorian chant. What's the implication is the people of the Middle Ages were old and ignorant, anachronistic, out of touch. But this new thing is with it, huh? Get it. As I mentioned, teachers in our public school, they continue a lot of this myth. Where did the view come from? And is it true? After all, if there's smoke, people say, well, there must be a fire somewhere, somehow. Where did it come from? In a nutshell, here's where it came from. From the Renaissance authors, from Enlightenment philosophers, popular writers, and anyone who dislikes on principle any period strongly influenced by Christianity. All those people contributed to this myth about the Middle Ages. In more recent times, historians of the Renaissance have probably been uh, more pers- than the most persistently scholarly pro- promoters of the lie. Why is that? Well, if you love a certain period of life and you make that your life study, uh, you're enamored with that, that historical period. That's your favorite period. And they're fond of showing how wonderful it is by contrasting with the the bad old days back then. This view and approach did not, of course, originate in the 20th century. It actually originated in the 14th century when the first Italian humanists, the original Renaissance men, they began to idealize their particular time, the classical and the, uh, their particular time in the Renaissance and the classical culture of ancient Greece and Rome. And so in order to exalt their culture and that past culture, to magnify the significance of their own literary works and accomplishments, what did they do? They deprecated the culture of the more recent pasts, deplorably backward and totally insufficiently concerned with the real world. And from there on, the Middle Ages became literally a historical football for many people of many persuasions to kick around. Many writers since have disparaged the medieval period out of sheer ignorance or due to a naive and sole reliance on the opinions of those original Renaissance writers or current Renaissance scholars who haven't really done their homework on any other age. Now, it should be noted that the first humanists, they were Catholic. First people of the Renaissance were Catholic. By the way, the church was promoter of many of the things in the Renaissance. Although some were critical of the church and others were interested in introducing uh, heterodoxical religious ideas, in most cases, their disparaging of the Middle Ages did not spring from some hatred or animus towards Catholicism, but from a desire to exalt their own particular time with its new artistic and literary styles and with their new optimistic view of the world and humanity. For example, the 14th century writer Giovanni Boccaccio, he thought that poetry had been dead until it was brought to life by Dante in the new age of rebirth, which which the Renaissance in Italian means. Well, the truth is, brothers and sisters, Dante was really a man of the Middle Ages, both of mentality and of faith. He had been born in the mid-13th century, 
which was certainly one of the greatest medieval centuries, because medievalism, we'll see at the video, goes from 500 up to the end of the 1300s, actually into the 1400s. Nonetheless, uh, Renaissance writers extolled both Dante and Giotto, Dante's contemporary, as modern of their time. While in the process, in numerous writings and with endless repetition, they heap scorn on the medieval art and architecture and philosophical thought. This attitude of men who were so convinced of their glory and superiority, well, guess what? It influenced later writers who admired it. According to uh, Professor Douglas Bush, the uh, anti-prejudices of 16th century Protestants and 18th century Enlightenment writers also contributed heavily to anti-medievalism. The leading one in that period was uh, the anti-Catholic Voltaire. He thought that real philosophy did not blossom until the end of the very bright 16th century. Professor Bush gives the most credit for shaping the anti-medieval lie, however, to the secular humanist, humanistic rationalism of the 19th century. This is what he says. From that point of view, the Middle Ages, for the point of view referring to the humanistic rationalism, from that point of view, the Middle Ages appeared as not much more than a long cultural lag, a period in which man was enslaved by a system based on religious superstition and unnatural restraint. This view is clearly on display in many, many books. But I'd like to mention uh, three in particular. The works of Jules uh, Michelet, Jacob Burkhart, and John Addington Simmons. They probably stand out among many of them. Jules Michelet, who is he? He was a French liberal historian who exalted the Renaissance as a heroic period of rediscovery of man and the world after a deplorable, as he said, dark age. He offered uh, an architectural analogy contrasting the Gothic style. This is what he said, which still supports the temple only with the aid of a cumbrous apparatus of props and buttresses. Comparing that with the rational, mathematical, self-supporting art of the Renaissance. As for medieval science, Jules Michelet claimed that it exists only thanks to the Arabs and the Jews. The rest is worse than worthless and useless. He believed that both nature and science had fallen victim to medieval terrorism and repression. Michelet had a lot of followers. One of them was Jacob Burkhardt, who wrote a book called The Civilization of the Renaissance in Italy. It was published in 1860. It's been uh, translated and republished many, many times since. The Renaissance could not have had a more ardent, zealous champion than this man. He used phrases from Michelet's works And this is what Burkhart gushed. To the discovery of the outward world, the Renaissance added a still greater achievement by first discerning and bringing to light the full, whole nature of man. He can characterize this uh, as worldliness, which for him meant a quality of earnestness so so modern that it can, excuse me, never be dislodged. Then he goes on to say, the Middle Ages, which spared themselves the trouble of induction and free inquiry, can have no right to impose upon us their dogmatical verdict in matters of such vast importance. Talk about being dogmatic. He's dogmatic, huh? And then another writer, John Addington Simmons, a 19th century literary critic. He was very much enamored of the Renaissance. And this is how he characterized the Middle Ages. As a time when man had lived enveloped in a cowl, a cowl referring to the hood over a monk, okay, He had not seen the beauty of the world or had seen it only to cross himself and turn himself aside and tell his beads and pray. Then he goes on in that same passage to describe St. Bernard passing along the shore of Loch Lehman without noticing, he said, the loveliness of the surroundings, but merely, is how he says it, bending a thought-burdened forehead over the neck of his mule. Even like this monk, humanity had passed a careful pilgrim intent on the terrors of sin, death, and judgment along the highways of the world, and had scarcely known that they were sight-worthy or that a life is blessing. Ignorance is acceptable, excuse me, 
Ignorance is acceptable to God as a proof of faith and submission. Abstinence and mortification are the only safe rules of life. These were the fixed ideas of the ascetic medieval church. Fortunately, uh, in his view, these depressing rules of the medieval, this oppressiveness, this darkness, this awkwardness, this ignorance, it was destroyed by the beautiful period of the Renaissance. Here's how he says it. Rending, rendering, rending the thick veil which they had drawn between the mind of man and outer world and flashing the light of reality upon the darkened place of his own nature. The Renaissance was the liberation of the reason from a dungeon, the double discovery of the outer world and the inner world. Well, you can see where he stands. Huh? He's a person who is enamored, all in for the Renaissance. Now, fortunately, there was a tiny shift in attitudes. There was an alternative thing happening in the 19th century view of the medievals, uh, medieval times. And it began to emerge uh, in, in the early part of the century due to the work of scholars who collected and started studying actual texts, the medieval texts. You know. These things were made from the perspective of their own worldview. Guys like Simmons and, uh, and Burkhardt and, and, uh, and uh, the other ones, they, they were just looking from it. I've often called it Rorschach historicizing. You know what the Rorschach test is? You know, you, they hold up a, an ink blot, and what do you do? What do you see there, they say? Oh, I see butterflies and, uh, and balloons. And let's say, well, this guy lives in a fantasy world, you know. But a lot of times that's what people do with history or even theology. They project their own agenda and they only search for the information they want, excluding or ignoring all the other information that may contradict anything that these people say. Well, there was a shift in it in the early part of the 19th century because scholars started gathering things and actually started to study the original text. Huh? The new information from these texts, well, they really suited the people of the Romantic period, that artistic and intellectual movement that reacted to what? To the time of the Enlightenment and to the classical artistic, in its classical artistic norms. In particular, the Romanticists, they disliked the denigration of the Middle Ages that was in vogue. But however, as much as they were trying to recover the Middle Ages, Norman Kanner, the Jewish uh, medieval writer, in his book called Inventing the Middle Ages, he says this, the romantics of the early 19th century replaced this negative view of the Middle Ages with the shining image of a Gothic culture steeped in idealism, spirituality, heroism, and adoration of women. But the romantics lacked the scholarship, the learning, and the instruments of research to go beyond the most superficial kind of inquiry into the medieval past. In other words, they liked it because of certain things, but they really didn't understand it. Both the Renaissance denigration of the Middle Ages and the romantic acclamation of medieval culture were almost exclusively based on mere ideological projects. The romantics liked the Middle Ages because they thought they saw in that world the beliefs and behaviors that contrasted vividly with the rationalism, the cold rationalism, the Enlightenment, and the mechanism of the Industrial Revolution, and the centralizing bureaucracy of the national state, which they found repulsive and conducive to dehumanization. So they exalted it a little bit, but for the wrong reasons. In the second half, though, of the 19th century, other movements came along that really began to push the anti-medieval days. Uh, they were nationalism, determinism, social Darwinism. All these began to influence the Victorians, uh, began to influence heavily. And the Victorian period, the Romanticists, they began to wane. The Jewish medieval writer, Cantor, he was moved to wonder why this era simply could not get the Middle Ages right. That's what he said. Did the 19th century historians misunderstand the Middle Ages? because they were early pioneers who worked with a very narrow database? Or was there something about the Victorian mind, its love of huge entities, vulgarly simple models, hastily generalized and overdetermined evolutionary schemes that made it unsuitable for doing lasting work in understanding and interpreting the Middle Ages? We may say that both conditions were at work in fostering the Victorian romantic misconstruction of the Middle Ages. In the early part of the 20th century, medieval studies began to become really popular with academia. And the research of medieval 
scholars, they began to turn up what? Documentary evidence that had been previously unknown or unutilized by many, many historians. And by the middle of the 20th century, a number of very first-rate works on various aspects of medieval thought and society has started to come available. Here's the problem, though. The writers of popular history had not yet gotten the word that there were some really good things found in the Middle Ages. And even though there was excellent academic work in the uh, history, uh, about medieval history, it was being done in the 20th century, resulted in many scholarly works that were available to anyone who who, uh, wanted to pursue it. People went with the popular versions. You know, when you have to do a little rigorous study, people kind of just kind of want to go with the Reader's Digest version of something, you know. It's not easy to read. It's really accessible. Now, these scholarly works, they range from studies of daily life in the Middle Ages to medieval science and technology to literature and art and philosophy. But as I said, these incredibly good researched works were largely ignored by the writers of popular uh, books of history. Instead, popular 20th century books What are they filled with? The rehashing of the same old tired lie and myth. For example, John Hale, he's the author of the 1965 Renaissance volume in the Time Life series. Remember that series, the Time Life series? You got a whole series of them. Well, he described the Renaissance mentality as contrasted with the medieval. This is what he said. Men and nature were treated not as generalizations of themselves, but as individual beings and things interesting for their own sake. What's the implication there? The implication would seem to be that the medieval people saw all things as just as abstraction, an uninteresting abstraction at that. And two pages later, John Hill says, we're told that the Renaissance people wanted a more practical kind of education, the one provided by the theological studies of the Middle Ages, and that teachers turned their back on the medieval idealization of poverty, celibacy, and seclusion, instead praised family life and the wise use of riches now the teaching of the church was not necessarily a, a killjoy nature. Even a Catholic historian like Anne uh, Fremantle, she displayed the same kind of anti-medieval uh, mentality. Nearly three, 30 years after the appearance of the Time Life books that bashed the Middle Ages, uh, we see another example of this in William Manchester's book called The World Lit Only by Fire, The Medieval Mind in Renaissance, A Portrait of an Age. Now, Manchester was a journalist. He wasn't a trained historian, even though he did write some historical biographies and some books on World War II. The problem is, while the scholars were complaining that all these popular works were uh, just skewing the whole view of the Middle Ages, Manchester's book sold. And apparently, his publisher didn't mind he was teaching falsehoods. What was Manchester's view of the Middle Ages? He had very few nuances. According to him, in medieval times, the strongest characteristic of the Catholic religion was complete resistance to change. Now, I'm going to come back to that, okay? But he believed the church resisted change and suppressed it. People not only did not know what time of day it was, they also had no sense of historical time. Medieval culture, what, was, what there was of it, could not compare with that of the classical ages or with culture today. As for the church, it was a disaster, riddled with corruption, superstition, and worldliness. Again, the difficulty in confronting the myth about the Dark Ages is that popular historical writers really have had much more influence than reputable disciplined scholars and researchers. The Dark Ages mentality, sadly, it still exists in modern academics, in our schools, from primary all the way up to the university college level. Now, the tide is beginning to turn among scholars, not so much among popular writers or the popular media, but among scholars. There was a real renaissance in the proper meaning of the word of interest in medieval studies in the late 19th century and early 20th century. See, by then, scientific medieval history, with its emphasis on systematic collection and analysis of ancient documents and other historical data, what happened? They became a, a discipline. People really got knuckled down and started really working at these things. Sadly, the development came uh, too late to squash 
the Renaissance, uh, the Renaissance myth and the medieval myth. Uh, myth. But it did give a solid foundation uh, for the flourishing of medieval studies in most countries of the West. For example, I'm going to give you some names. English and American historians such as Charles Homer Haskins, Lynn Thorndike, Don David Knowles, Richard Southern, Christopher Dawson, Eleanor Shipley, Duckett, Regine Pernon, and many others who are both Catholic and non-Catholic, what they're doing now is helping to demolish this myth that the Middle Ages was just one long, dark, forsaken period. One recent uh, college book actually stated that there was no real rupture between the medieval days and the Renaissance period, and that there wasn't any real dark age at all. In fact, the Renaissance was not superior to that age that preceded it. In fact, it built upon it. Now, that's a, that's a breath of fresh air that uh, we need to understand. But it's still rare to find in a lot of mainstream media and popular writing and even in schools. I say that because just a decade ago, one professor of Renaissance, an early modern man, actually dared someone, a man or a woman, to really find a significant contribution that was made by the Middle Ages, such as, for example, individual human rights. Then it could prove to him that the Middle Ages was a great period. Otherwise, he could not find any good in the Middle Ages. Well, see, in his mind, individual human rights considered one of the great con contributions, he believed, from the Enlightenment period of the 18th century. And he thought he was on very safe grounds in making that charge or that challenge. Well, what would happen? A few years later, the needle writer Brian Tierney, the idea of natural rights, what did he do? He traced the concept of back of human rights back to medieval philosophers, starting with whom our great St. Thomas Aquinas. Now, a good rousing start to the revision started with Homer Haskin's 1927 classic, The Renaissance of the 12th Century. Pay attention to that title, The Renaissance of the 12th Century. The first line of the preface, it really throws down the gauntlet to the bashers of medieval studies and medieval writers. Here's what he writes. The title of this book will appear to many to contain a flagrant contradiction, a renaissance in the 12th century. Do not the Middle Ages, that epic of ignorance, stagnation, and gloom, stand in the sharpest contrast to the light and the progress and freedom of the Italian Renaissance which followed? How could there be a Renaissance in the Middle Ages when men had no eye for the joy and the beauty and the knowledge of this passing world? Their gaze was ever fixed on the terrors of the world to come. In truth, and he continues, the Middle Ages, Cantor says, in truth, Exhibit life and color and change. Much eager search after knowledge and beauty. Much creative accomplishment in art and literature and institutions. However, this conception runs counter to ideas widely prevalent, not only among the unlearned, but among many who ought to know better. To these, the Middle Ages are synonymous with all that is static, uniform, and unprogressive. Medieval is applied to anything outgrown. The barbarism of the Goths and the Vandals is thus spread out over the following centuries, even to the Gothic architecture, which was one of the crowning achievements of the construction genius of the race. On the other hand, he adds, those who speak of the Enlightenment and the Renaissance must ignore the Renaissance preoccupation with such enlightened pursuits as alchemy and demonology. That was part of the Renaissance, you know. People kind of take, pick and choose what they want. Well, Haskell's work demonstrated the 12th century's tremendous interest in learning and education and its revival of the intensive study of the Latin language and classical literature. See, these studies had declined following uh, the uh, early cultivation of them during Charlemagne. Uh, with the collapse of the Roman Empire, things declined. Science, philosophy, jurisprudence, law, and historical writing all underwent revivals in the 12th century, along with masterpieces in the artistic area. So in summary, the claim that the Middle Ages were one long dark age of ignorance and superstition, relieved only by the advent of the Renaissance and later by the succeeding movements of the Enlightenment, Rationalism, and Monarchy, it's just that. It's a claim, and it's a false one. It was developed by the Renaissance authors, the people of the Renaissance, 
and people who loved that period, by the Enlightenment philosophers, by popular writers, and by anyone who disliked or still dislikes on principle any period influenced by Christianity. In other words, most of it came out of and still propagated by uninformed and oftentimes anti-Catholic mentality. The truth is, brothers and sisters, and we're going to see it in just a moment reconfirmed in this short video, the Middle Ages was an extraordinary period of time which created a launching pad for so much in later ages. I'll be discussing some of these contributions and other myths up the road. But let me give you a brief list of some of the great contributions of the Middle Ages. See, at the beginning of the Dark Ages, after the fall of the Western Roman Empire, there came a chaotic period of massive foreign invasion and breakdown in every area of life and culture. During this time of great upheaval, civilization survived almost exclusively in one institution, the church, the Catholic Church. It was the monks and the monasteries that preserved almost all that we know from the previous centuries, how copying by hand those great manuscripts to preserve learning. The Catholic Church developed a school system from grade school to the university to educate both men and women, young to older. And, brothers and sisters, the Catholic Church was the protector in the Middle Ages of academic freedom and not the enemy of academic freedom, as so many people falsely claim. The medieval university begged, begged for a papal charter. Why? Because it guaranteed them academic freedom that was often oppressed by the local kings and local authorities and institutions where they were founded. You know, one is tempted here to compare the Catholic attitude towards study and scholarship with the Reformation attacks on scholars, so the Protestant attacks on scholars such as Copernicus and Kepler, both of whom were protected and encouraged by the Catholic Church. Examples of groundbreaking medieval scholarship, it would fill volumes. In philosophy alone, the work of Duns Scotus, St. Thomas Aquinas, St. Bonaventure, Abelard, St. Albert the Great, it's staggering. Staggering. In science, it was against Albertus Magnus, St. Albert the Great. He was the teacher of St. Thomas Aquinas. He was the first botanist since the classical times. He literally had, in his time, huge laboratories with all these specimens from everywhere, from everywhere he could gather them. He was way ahead of our time. It was the Franciscan, Roger Bacon, who first developed the science of optics, mapping parts of the eye with extraordinary accuracy. By the way, a practical application of that new study in optics was what? The invention of the eyeglasses. We're not certain about who invented it, but I'll tell you what, the medieval scholarly communities really appreciated it as their eyesight dimmed. As for theoretical science, late medieval scientists in England began to explore the mathematical physics on which Isaac Newton would later build. Writing in homiletic and pastoral review, Father Joseph de la Torre, a specialist in Thomistic theology and philosophy, he traced the origin of the great scientific breakthroughs of the 16th and 17th century. He demonstrates that they were actually, in fact, the consequences of the epistemological realism of 13th century philosophers with St. Thomas at the head. Here's what he writes. He says, the Thomistic method was the real cause of the scientific breakthrough, not the method by, advocated by Francis Bacon or that of René Descartes. They were both in the 17th century. Descartes reduced it to simple mathematical deductions, mistrusting uh, observation experiment, and Bacon reduced it to pure observation experiment, excluding mathematics. The real creators of the scientific breakthrough, such as Leonardo da Vinci, Copernicus, Galileo, Kepler, and of course Newton, they followed the golden rules formulated by whom? St. Thomas Aquinas. Medieval scholars produced massive, uh, masterful works on theology, political science, law, teaching techniques, and much more. And why was that? Because they were willing to explore every aspect of reality because of their commitment to what? To rational analysis and their confidence in human reason. For them, the intellect was the highest faculty of the soul. And the truths of this CERN they believe couldn't possibly contradict the truths of faith because God is the author of both of them. You know, we often say if a, if a religion is 
contradictory to good reason, good human reason. It's bad religion. It's a good rule of thumb. If your religion tells you to cut off someone's head, it's bad religion. It's counter to uh, human reason, huh? That's what the church has always taught. The whole sprawling, inquiring intellectual movement, one of the major developments in Westernization, civilization, originated, fostered, and carried, and protected by the Catholic Church starting in the Middle Ages. Get this, medieval third, uh, thinkers were also concerned about economics, you know, and they developed moral, moral principles, like the whole question of usury, charging interest, huh? It demonstrates the constant concern of medieval thinkers about justice and charity when it came to the economy, as well as other spheres of life. It thus reflects the concern of the church with promoting economic, the church was promoting economic prosperity and progress. This concern was reflected with great clarity in the medieval guilds. You know what the guilds were? They were groups of people in towns, the master builders, the stone workers, the carpenters, the shoemakers. And you, you worked your way up through the guild. You'd find a master. You'd start it off as an apprentice, and you'd learn. Then you'd become a journeyman, and literally, what you do as a journeyman? You literally would journey all the way around to distant cities and hook up with other masters and learn as many techniques. And you come back, and you take your test to become a master, and then you would get an apprentice. But these uh, guilds, not only did they develop skilled workers, but they also paved the way for the development of capitalism and for workers' rights and for the care of the worker if he was injured. When you go back to the medieval days, the social service provided by guilds for their workers, part of their guild, utterly impressive. And just as notable, uh, the first, as I mentioned before, architectural style in over 700 years was developed in the Middle Ages, the great Gothic cathedrals. They had walls that soared in the sky, numerous windows to let incredible light. If anybody been to Notre Dame, for example, in Paris, or even more impressive, if you get to Notre Dame, you go out the front doors, go that direction, two blocks, and you hit Saint Chapelle. It's breathtaking, breathtaking. It was built by King Louis the Ninth, Fourteenth, to uh, excuse me, King Louis the Ninth, to hold the relics that he had gathered from the east, particularly the crown of thorns. Uh, that will be de- it uh, is always uh, brought out on Good Friday and march to this from uh, Saint Chapelle to Notre Dame and back. But this beautiful thing is when you walk upstairs in it, it's like being in a giant jewel box. You're surrounded by stained glass windows. You don't know how they stand there, but they're held by these thin, beautiful buttresses that just, it's breathtaking, breathtaking. All came out of that. They went down as deep as a subway station, as hundreds of feet in the air supported by the flying buttresses. G.K. Chesterton summed it up well when he called the medieval civilization a great growth of new things produced by a living thing. Contrasted with the Renaissance is a resurrection of old things discovered in a dead thing, the ancient world. He went so far as to call Renaissance architecture the relapse, since it was not a new creation like the Gothic, but just a harking back to the domes of Rome. In other words, it's a myth. The medieval times, an incredibly creative time. What I'd like to do right now is just show you a brief video, and then we'll take a little break if you want to come back and ask questions. This is from Prager University. We're trying to get Dennis Prager to come here and talk, but if you ever get a chance, go to Prager, Prager, Dennis Prager, go to Prager University. Five-minute videos on many areas, but this is very, very well done, and it's just a simple little uh, presentation. No period of history is more misunderstood or underappreciated than the Middle Ages. Ten centuries from the fall of the Roman Empire in the 5th century to the start of the Renaissance in the 15th. This is especially true between the year 1000 when global warming brought grapes to England and grain to the coast of Greenland, doubling the population and reviving town life all across Europe in 1348 after the warming had ended and the blackjack had arrived from the east. Let's take a closer look at these years. We'll make a good start by expelling some nonsense. The people of the Middle Ages did not believe the earth was flat. They knew it was round. The ancients said it was round. The fathers of the church said it was round. They saw it shatter during the eclipse of the moon and 
the shadow was round, they saw masts and ships sinking below the horizon. Round. More nonsense. The Middle Ages were cheerless. Like the first, they were full of color. Of celebrations involving everybody in town. They invented the carnival. They revived popular drama which had lain dormant for a thousand years. Whatever they did, whether it was sitting or fighting or repenting or falling in love, or traveling thousands of miles to Rome or to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, they did it with energy and gusto. What do we owe to the Middle Ages? How about the university? Medieval man invented it. For the first time in the history of the world, you could go to Paris or Bologna or Padua or Oxford or Prague or Cologne and study under masters of law, medicine, philosophy, theology, and your degree, designating you as a master or a doctor, would hold good anywhere in Europe. It was an international community of scholars. A young Thomas Aquinas, born in southern Italy at the beginning of the 13th century, would travel to Cologne to study philosophy under the philosopher biologist Albert the Great, then to Paris, where he taught theology and philosophy, then to Rome, and back to France. And this sort of thing was the rule among scholars, not the exception. How about modern science? Thomas's teacher, Albert, was a biologist. Why should that surprise us? Medieval man believed that God made the world as an ordered whole. They learned it both from scripture and from pagan thinkers, such as Aristotle. Science did not burst on the scene of Galileo. Copernicus died in the 16th century, but he was a priest of astronomer at a Polish university founded in the Middle Ages. He wasn't even the first man to suggest that the Earth orbited the sun. Others had ventured this suggestion. Most prominent was the late medieval Nicholas of Cusa, a philosopher and a cardinal of the church. How about our if the Middle Ages were dark and ignorant, how come ordinary people, masons, carpenters, painters, sculptors, lasers, erected the most beautiful and majestic buildings to grace the earth, the Gothic cathedrals, without power tools, with pulleys and winches and scaffolding in their bare hands, they built up lacework, stone and glass, flooding vast interior spaces with color and light, we have nothing to match their complexity and beauty. And art? Studying the ancients, medieval man produced whole genres of art that the world had never seen. There had never been anything like Dante's Divine Comedy, or Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, or the Arthurian legends of Quentin de Troyes, or the paintings of Jumbo, or the astonishingly beautiful precise work of the illuminators of manuscripts. What else do we owe to them? Western music. They invented our musical notation and Western harmony, not to mention the humble parents we enjoy at Christmas time. A tradition of local self-government. Witness the chartered towns all over Europe, free associations of men united for the common good, friars, guildsmen, Members of lay orders devoted to good works, people who established schools, orphanages, and hospitals. Apart from the Dark Ages, which it is popularly called, the Middle Ages might better be described as the brilliant ages. The startling epoch of progress from science to art, from philosophy to medicine. Indeed, in one crucial way, we are less civilized than those who enhanced human existence over a thousand years ago. We dismiss the achievements of our ancestors and fall short of them. They honor their ancestors and surpass them. I'm Anthony Esselin of Providence College for Prager University. Join Prager University. Click here to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Click here to sign up. I want to thank you for coming. It's always a joy. It always forces me to go through things. So we'll continue with other uh, myths of the church. Things like uh, the Inquisition we're going to cover. Things like uh, Pope Pius XII. Did he do anything to, to counteract 
the horrors of Nazism, all those kinds of questions that raise that people want to discredit the church so they could discredit our truth. Have a blessed night. Good evening. It's wonderful to gather with you again to uh, continue this talk. You know, I chose this, uh, this theme of the 20 top myths about the Catholic Church. Uh, the one mistake I made, I tried to do too many the first year because uh, there's a lot of material. So I just do two a night and we're just going to go through it. But the reason I chose this is because as with these two myths that we're going to hear tonight, what happens is the secular world uses these myths to undermine our faith and the credibility of our faith. Uh, they want to say, see, for example, as we're going to cover the issue of the church and slavery, they'll say something like, you know, Catholicism has to be false because it once endorsed slavery. And so you hear this and you t accept it as de facto, and that's not true. No. It didn't flat out endorse slavery you know. but then it'll go on saying in the early church approved of slavery you can see it in St. Paul's writings uh, if slaves are to obey their masters Colossians 3 verses 22 and 25 and Ephesians 6 5 and 8 and furthermore the Catholic Church didn't even get around to repudiating slavery until 1890s and prior to that the church actually supported it why do they say those things as they'll say other things about other myths? Well, they'll say, okay, so the church now doesn't support slavery. But that proves how changeable the Catholic faith is and the Catholic doctrine. So if the Catholic faith can flip-flop on such an important moral issue as slavery, well, why not on other supposedly unchangeable doctrines such as the immorality of contraception or abortion or premarital, extramarital sex, or homosexual sex, or gay marriage. See, that's why it's important to know information. That's why Father Dave Heaney established the university series, to help equip us so that we're not just accepting what people say about uh, any particular issue. And like a lot of things asked about the Catholic faith, there's only about 20, 20 top ones and variations of it. So tonight we're going to talk about uh, this topic about the church and slavery. Did the church endorse and support slavery? Did it, uh, uh, did it only in 1890s repudiate this horrible institution? Well, the answer to that is no, it didn't. So tonight to kind of approach this, I'd like to do three things on the issue of the church and slavery. Number one, you have to be clear about what we mean by the word slavery. See, a lot of things can be lumped under that, and as you'll hear, it can be very confusing. So I'm going to first talk about that, and then second, I'm going to talk about a brief a review of slavery, the history of slavery. What's been happening over the centuries? And then I'm going to talk about the church and the actual issue of slavery. So let's start with the first point. What do we mean when we talk about slavery? Well, by that word, what we're talking about is a condition of involuntary servitude in which a human being is actually regarded as no more than a property of another person without any basic human rights. In other words, a slave is a thing and not a person. And so under that definition or with that definition, Slavery is intrinsically evil. 
since no person may legitimately be regarded or treated as just a mere thing. This form of slavery is called chattel slavery. C-H-A-T-T-E-L. Chattel slavery. Slavery. But there are other ways that that word has been used, such as in reference to the slavery talked about in the Old Testament, where slaves were not, uh, they, were, they did belong to the family, they were owned by the family, but it was more, more in a familial relationship. You remember Abraham and Sarah had uh, the slave Haggai. She was part of the family. In fact, Abraham had a child with Haggai. So it was a little bit different than just what we call about chattel slavery. There are other circumstances in which a person can justly be compelled to servitude against one's will. For example, uh, prisoners of war or prisoners in jail. They can lose their freedom and be forced into some kind of servitude within certain limits. Also, people can sell their labor for a period of time. That's called indentured servitude or uh, indentured service. A form of that was serfs in the medieval days, and I'll come back to that in a few minutes. In the medieval days, the serfs, they would enter into a relationship with the king or lord, and they would live on and work the king or the lord's land. And when the harvest came, they would give an agreed-upon percentage to the Lord or the king, and they would keep a little bit for themselves as caring for their family. And on the other side, the king and the Lord had an obligation to the serf to take care and protect that serf and his family. So there's a big difference. But a lot of times what historians will do will morph one word into the other and then use it as a way of saying, see, the church didn't say this, didn't say it about this as a way that proving somehow that the church endorsed slavery. So these forms of servitude or slavery different in kind than what we are calling shadow slavery. Prisoners of war and criminals, they can lose their uh, freedom against their will, as a slave does, but they don't become property of their captor, even when their imprisonment is just. They still possess what? Basic human rights, inalienable rights, and they can't be subjected to certain forms of punishment like torture. Likewise, indentured servitude, they sell their labor, but they don't sell their inalienable rights. And they may not contract or be contracted to perform services that are immoral. And moreover, they freely agree to exchange their labor for some kind of benefit, transportation, food, lodging, etc., So their servitude is not involuntary, it's voluntary. And that's true for serfdom. As I mentioned, you have to be clear about the term because people incorrectly conflate those kinds of servitude under the title of slavery and it causes confusion and it makes it very easy to attack the church. As I'll talk in a few minutes when we get to the Middle Ages, how people say, oh, well, all they did, the church did, was just change the word, slave to serf. Big, big difference. What is a slave? We talked about slavery. What is the history of slavery? Just briefly, shadow slavery, the type we're talking about, it's an ancient, ancient historical reality. In fact, historical records show that slavery is even older than the pyramids of Egypt. And it's been universal in every society that was sufficiently wealthy enough to afford it, including many aboriginal societies. You know, in our politically correct world, it's amazing when you read historians, how they extol the nobleness and the beauty of the people here in America. And boy, those people from Western civilization, they came over and destroyed this absolute primeval, paradisical Like it was paradise. I have to say, oh, you mean those Aztecs that captured slaves and they took them up the ziggurat, the temple, and they carved their heart out and kicked their bodies down the uh, thing? Those nice people? 
You know, it's amazing how they do this. The fact of the matter is, uh, American Indians in the Northwest had extensive slavery before the arrival of Columbus, as did other Native American tribes. In fact, some of the Native American tribes actually, when the African slaves came, had African slaves, as did uh, the Native people of Mexico, Central America, and South America, and as we well know, in Africa. You know, the African trade, slave trade, happened because bigger tribes conquered smaller tribes and sold those people to the slave traders, whether it was the Western Europeans or, in many cases, a lot of it, to the Islamic leaders. And sadly, you know, we know that slavery even exists today. <clears throat> Let me sound strange. But according to the U.S. State Department and report, as many as 27 million people around the world are exploited in modern slavery, and most of them in Muslim countries and in Central Africa. So, a slave is what? A human being who in the eyes of the law and custom is the possession or the shadow of another human being or a small group of people. Ownership of slave entails what? Absolute control. That slave has no rights, including this control, the right to punish and, if need be, to kill your slave, but that wouldn't be very profitable. And to direct their behavior in all things and to transfer even their ownership, sometimes even separating the families. The existence of slavery was a function of what? Human productivity. There will always be a demand for slaves when the average person can produce sufficient surplus so it becomes profitable for him to have slaves when the cost of maintaining and controlling the slave is offset by what? The profit that they bring through their production. Also, uh, this kind of slavery can exist as a form of consumption where sufficiently wealthy people, they use slaves in non-productive roles, personal servants concubines or entertainers or even bodyguards. This kind of chattel consumeristic slavery is what's present in many Islamic societies. All early empires made the use of slave labor. Slave labor. But as the classical scholar M. I. Finley explained that the Greeks and the Romans, they achieved truly the first slave societies becoming highly dependent on large-scale employment of slave labor in both the countryside and in the cities. In fact, at the height of their empires, slaves probably outnumbered free citizens, both in Athens and in Rome. And there was no historical record, no historical record of anybody raising a voice about the horror of the evil of slavery. You know, all the secular world, I always get amazed, they did nothing, nothing to change or to criticize or condemn an institution of slavery. None of the secular world. The church, over a period of time, did, and I'll tell you how it did it. But it did it. But we're criticized because on day one, we didn't come out and say, this is evil. So we're nullified and they're the good guys. So, did the church endure, endorse the institution of slavery? And is it true that the Catholic Church only repudiated slavery in the 1890s? Well, let's look at the history. And you've got to see the, the whole history of it. When the Catholic Church was born at the Feast of Pentecost, she was born into a world dominated by the Roman Empire. In fact, it was at its peak, absolute peak. And in this world, slavery was universally accepted as a social and an economic institution pertaining literally to the very structure of society. Just as today, the system of remunerated or paid employment is part of our whole society. It's just taken for granted. And just as in modern society, no one would possibly conceive seriously the abolition of a paid employment. Well. It didn't concur to anybody in the ancient world that uh, one would advocate the abolition of slaves. And that would be even true for the church. 
And a big reason for that is what? The early Christians, as witnessed by the early writings of St. Paul and other areas of the New Testament, what did they think? If you read St. Paul's early letters, what does he think? He believes the end of the world is coming right around the corner. Maybe a week, two weeks, maybe a month, maybe a year. They thought it was coming just around the corner. And you see that reflected in St. Paul's writings. So early Christians believed what? They believed it was their job to preach the gospel, as Jesus told them, to get people to become a believer in Jesus, to bring them to Jesus so that they could be saved before the end of the world would come. There was no real thought about changing the world with all its structure. They were only interested in changing people's hearts for the immediate coming of Jesus Christ. And that's why the early Christians more or less tolerated uh, chattel or uh, property slavery of their day, as reflected, as I said, in many parts or certain parts of the New Testament. But later on, as the church begins to grow and mature, when she realizes that Jesus Christ is not coming back in the next year or in the short period of time in the future, well, she realized that she was going to take a long, hard journey through history, and she began to reflect on the gospel and her responsibility in the world to do what? To transform the world and all its institutions. How? Literally from the inside out. So it, it, it took time and it took freedom for the church to begin to reflect on the gospel message as it applied uh, to the world around her. You know, when you're under persecution, as the early church did, you don't have time to think about theological questions. You're just trying to keep your soul in decent enough shape so if they capture you and they execute you, you can go to heaven. You don't see a, a whole lot of things. It's only when what happens... If you remember at the Edict of Milan, 313, Constantine passed this edict. He gave Christianity legal status for the first time in the Roman world. And with that legal status, they had the freedom to practice their faith. Literally, underground in the catacombs, now they come forward into society and they begin to mix with society. And as they go and mix with the pagan society, what happens? As they preach the gospel, people start asking questions of the gospel. And that's what we call theological reflection or the development of theology. And that's what began to happen. The church began to reflect on a lot of things. This theological reflection, I said, came at the time of the passing of the Edict of Milan. See, the Catholic Church, if you study history, it didn't articulate certain aspects of faith or doctrine of faith until after the Edict of Milan. As the church began to reflect on the truths as it interacted with the world, it began to go its understanding. And that's a concept called the development of doctrine. That doesn't mean the church makes up truths. It doesn't make up truths. It rather reflects on it and it begins to deepen its understanding. Kind of an organic thing. The seed that has all the potential bursts forth in new life and it creates a greater entity, a plant. Huh? But there's a, there's a development, a connection to this. You know, like you hear sometimes uh, you'll be challenged to say, well, how could you teach that the Pope is infallible? It was only defined in 1870. What a stupid religion. You just make it up, pull it out of thin air, like kind of a, a magician pulling something out of a hat? No. The church had always believed in infallibility. It's only when it was being challenged in a world or confused that the church will articulate it. So as the world went out, as a church went out into the world and they started preaching Christ, that Jesus Christ is Lord, the questions came back to them, well, when was he Lord? Was he Lord at his birth or was it at his baptism? Did it happen at his death? No, 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 no. He was the eternal word. Remember when the church defined that Jesus Christ was God? Do you remember what year it was? It was 325 A.D. at the Council of Nicaea. Now, for 325 years or 300 some plus years, did the church not believe that truth? No. It believed it. But as the questions came to it, it began to articulate clearly Jesus Christ is true God. 
And then further reflection, later on at the Council of Chalcedon in the year 451, he's, he's true God, one divine person and two natures intimately connected. That divine mystery, the consubstantiality. But these are all these questions that came up because it was interacting with the world. It wasn't the church just started believing that Jesus was Lord at 325 or that he was one divine person with two natures in 451, but the articulation came to clarify for the world what we believed. Other questions, for example, how many books are in the Bible and what books were in the Bible? That didn't happen until about the year 391. We didn't have a Bible until 391? No, no, there was, there was the books that were treasured, but the question asks, well, which ones are in and which ones are out? Because there was all kinds of writings, and the church would gather and reflect upon it. And the criterion was established, and so you came up with 46 in the old and 27 in the new. That happened at, in the year 391 AD and reconfirmed throughout history. Fully articulated when Martin Luther challenged it and said, no, it's not that. It's only 39 in the old and 27 in the new. The church we said, no, it's always been 46 and 27. So these questions you see come up as you go through history. Sacraments. What's a sacrament? How many are sacraments? How do you define a sacrament? One time they said there was 14 sacraments in a loose definition. Eventually they said, no, no, no. It's much more specific than just being a sacramental holy water. Sacraments are different. And it came up with the seven as they reflected upon what Jesus gave them. So the, uh, the church, as it grew, it began to ponder not just on its doctrine of faith, but on the moral issues as they faced them. Namely, as we're talking tonight, about slavery. So the early church more or less tolerated slavery of their day, as we see reflected in the early writings of St. Paul, and the fact that after Christianity became the religion of the Roman Empire in the beginning of the 400s and stuff, slavery was not immediately outlawed. Again, it takes time to reflect about what this is. How does it, how does it work? But even if that's true, this doesn't mean that Christianity was compatible with Roman slavery or that the church did not contribute to its demise. In that regard, there's a number of very important points to be kept in mind. First, while St. Paul told slaves to obey their master, and that's what you hear the second one, look at he says, obey your master, he's approving slavery. No. Remember, he was talking about the context that the world was going to end. Be as good as you can where you're at so you can get to be home in heaven. That's the basic thing. But he told them to obey their masters. He didn't make a general defense of slavery any more than he made a general defense of the pagan government of Rome, which Christians, he instructed them also to obey, despite a lot of the injustices in the, in the government. St. Paul seems simply to have regarded slavery as an intractable part of the social order, an order that he thought was going to come to an end in the very near future. It's all coming to an end. You don't waste a lot of time on it. Huh? Second, St. Paul told the masters to treat their slaves justly and kindly, implying that slaves are not just mere property for the master to do what they please. Third, Paul implied that the brotherhood shared by Christians is ultimately incompatible with chattel slavery. And we see that reflected in the case of the letter of St. Paul to Philemon. It was a case of a runaway slave. He had run away from his master. And, and technically, in the Roman day, the day of St. Paul, if that happened, you kill the slave. Because you don't want the rest of your slaves to go. Get rid of the bad one, you know. I, my mom grew up in a cattle ranch and... Uh, uh, once a cow learns how to get through the barbed wire, he starts teaching the other ones. So you, you get rid of them. Send them to McDonald's for a little hamburger. You don't keep them around because he teaches bad habits to the other cattle. I didn't believe that, but they do. So that's, that was the, the going. That was what was done in those days. But Paul wrote, writes to Philemon, the slave master, instructing him to do what? Not only receive Onesimus back, not as a slave, but as a brother. You find that in Philemon 6, 
With respect to salvation in Christ, later on you hear him in Ephesians 3, 27, 28, that in Christ there is neither what? Neither slave or free. You are all one in Christ. Fourth, the Christian principles of charity, love your neighbor as yourself, and the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. These were espoused in the New Testament. And in time, the church began to reflect. They say, wait a minute, the very heart of our faith, of God of mercy and love, it's totally incompatible with chattel slavery. Even if, because of its deeply established role as a social institution, even if it was there, it's incompatible. That was a point that began to become very clear as we reflect upon uh, the reality of the world, the gospel, as it interacts, and the institutions we face. Now, people sometimes say, well, that just nullifies it. Really? You know, the church often speaks on things in society, huh? And how well does our, uh, our, our, our secular world respond? Oh, perfect obedience, right? I mean, how many people, we say this is wrong, and they still do it. We say abortion is wrong. But it's legal, isn't it? And we're supposed to be enlightened people. You see, a lot of people don't see things in the context of development of, the, of history and how we grow and understand Fifth, while the Christian empire didn't immediately uh, outlaw slavery, you can read the church fathers, those theologians that wrote from the first century to the sixth century, we call them the church fathers. You know, they renounced slavery, denounced it. People like St. Gregory Nyssa and St. John Chrysostom. But then, even though they denounced it, oftentimes those guys were exiled by the secular state the leaders. And they certainly were persecuted. They didn't listen to them. And as I mentioned before, that happens still today. You know, the church speaks very clearly how we should behave. You should go to Mass every Sunday. Third commandment. And you know what? About one quarter of the people come to Mass on Sunday. You see, so you have to see this. Six, some early Christians... They liberated their slaves. While some churches, they literally redeemed slaves uh, by ransoming them. In fact, some Christians in the early church literally took the place of a slave. Traded themselves for that slave so that slave could be free. St. Francis was going to do that. Some of the other saints were willing to go to the Muslim countries to trade themselves in and free of slave. A Christian slave. Seven, even where slavery was not altogether repudiated, slaves and freemen had equal access to the sacraments, and many clergy came from the slave background. In fact, two of our popes, Pope Pius I and Pope Callistus, they were both former slaves. And the unique thing about Christianity was that blew away the secular Roman world was the fact that Slaves and free had equal status in the church. Eighth, the church ameliorated the harsher aspects of slavery in the empire, even trying to protect slaves by law until slavery disappeared in the West. And you see this process little by little as the church gets traction in the world and gets a foot and a voice in society. It begins to bring the gospel to bear and little by little it begins to challenge this horrific institution. Of course, you know, if you study history, slavery which was kind of eliminated by the 10th century, as we'll hear in a few moments, it was resurrected during the Renaissance period as what? As the Europeans encountered the Muslim slave traders and the indigenous people of the Americas a little later on with the founding of the New World. So during the Roman Empire, the church basically coexisted with the reality of slavery. But all the while, as it's reflecting, the tension between the support of this reality of slavery and the emphasis on the equality of all in the eyes of God, the tension began to grow. And with the demise of the Roman Empire, 
what did the do? The church do? It began to extend an embrace to those in slavery, giving them all the rights of the church. One thing they didn't at that time, they didn't, they were denied only ordination to the priesthood. The historian Pierre Bonacier expressed the matter as well as anyone. He said this, a slave was baptized and has a soul. He was then unambiguously a man. And with slaves recognized as human beings, well, then what happened? The priests, the church began to urge owners to free their slaves as the infinitely commendable act. And to ins- for what reason? To ensure your own salvation. And there's many, many records of wills that were written where they practice manumission, which means freeing the slave. Slavery began to decline uh, in the latter days of the Roman Empire. For what reason? Certainly the influence of the church, but also if you study history, Rome begins to crumble. It begins to crumble specifically because of the slave labor they employed. It's what happened. They were no longer going out because people now had everything done to the, before them by slaves. By the way, you read a wonderful book called uh, How the West Won by Rodney Starks. And I was just shocked when I read it. He had a chapter called The Roman Interlude. He said Rome was not a great empire. It was a great military empire, and it conquered a lot of people, and it adopted it brought back from them all their creativity, all their ingenuity. Basically, Rome borrowed everything from Greece and just put a Roman name to it or a Latin name to it. But they really didn't. The only thing that Romans invented is a pretty good thing. They invented cement. But outside of that, it was all borrowed from other people, and their undoing was they had everybody doing everything, the slaves, so there was no creativity, no ingenuity. And one of the things is that economics will also play a part in in the issue of slavery itself, in the bigger picture. So as the Roman Empire begins to decline because of the uh, lack of the military power, it starts declining in Rome, they don't go out on these big campaigns, they don't bring back a lot of slaves. Also, the fertility rate among the Roman slaves was very, very low. There was few women slaves and malnutrition uh, really didn't produce any offspring hardly at all. So you would think, okay, it's beginning to falter now, but what happened? If you remember in history, as Rome falls, the the new people, the barbarians from the north, the uh, Germanic kingdoms, they come down and start their campaigns. And once again, the slave trade is resurrected. It produces a whole new source of slaves. Although no one really knows how many slaves were in Europe during the 6th century, they seem to be incredibly plentiful. And the treatment that they did to their slaves was far, far harsher than the Romans. In the legal codes of the various Germanic groups that ruled in the place where Rome had once been, slaves were equated, they were not even human, they were treated as livestock, literally. Nevertheless, despite that, what's happening? The church is beginning to make its inroads to its missionary activity. See, most of the uh, uh, Germanic tribes, they were pagan. So it took some time for the church to get in to evangelize with the gospel. But the doctrines of the church, that slaves were human and not chattel, they also had another really remarkable implication. They were human beings and they were members of the church. What had began to happen? They began to intermarry. Okay, they intermarried. And that begins to bring down the... The, the wall between free and slave. In fact, one of the most celebrated unions took place in 649 AD when Clovis II, the king of the Franks, he married his British slave, Bathilda. And when Clovis died in the year 757, Bathilda did what? She ruled as the regent, the queen, until her son could grow up to become the king. And she used her position in an extraordinary way to mount a campaign to do what? To halt slave trade and to redeem those in slavery. And upon her death, the church has since canonized her. But she was a slave. But through the intermarriage, things began to break down. At the end of the 8th century, Charlemagne vehemently opposed slavery. He was a Catholic uh, emperor, huh? 
Not only him, but all the popes and many other powerful clerical voices all condemned slavery. In the ninth century, Bishop Agobard of Lyon thundered, All men are brothers. All invoke the one same Father, God. The slave and the master, the poor and the rich man, the ignorant and the learned, the weak and the strong. None has been raised above the other. There is no slave or free, but all in all things and always there is only one Christ. At the very same time, Abbot Smagard of San Miguel wrote a work dedicated to the Emperor Charlemagne. He said, Most merciful king, forbid that there should be any slave in your kingdom. Soon no one doubted that slavery itself was a divine law. That's the 8th century. So you see the church getting a foot into society, bringing to bear the gospel upon the institution of society, and beginning to change this horrific institution. During the 11th century, both St. Wolfstein and St. Anselm, they campaigned vigorously to remove all vestiges of slavery in Christendom. And according to the historian Mark Bloch, no man, no real Christian at any rate, could thereafter legitimately be held as the property of another. Now, I mentioned earlier when I was talking about definition of slavery. There are many historians that insist that there, that slavery never came to an end. There was medieval slavery. That nothing happened other than a linguistic shift from the word slave to the word serf. But you know, they are being disingenuous. They're playing word games. Because serfs were not shadow slaves. They had significant rights and substantial de- degree of discretion in their life. So they said they would make a, basically a contract with their lord or their king to live on the land, to produce, to make the land produce. They give a a large potion to the king or the lord and they keep some for themselves. But in turn, the lord had to abide by the agreements. They had to protect them and care for them. They had to, uh, they were allowed to marry. They couldn't separate families. All the things went on with the the, uh, other kinds of shadow slavery. They were forbidden. They married whom they wished, and their families were not subject to sale or dispersal. They paid rent and thus controlled their own time and their pace of work. In some places, the serfs owed their lord a number of days of labor each year, but the obligation was limited, more similar to what we consider now hired hands. You couldn't work them on Sunday. See, although the serfs were bound to a lord by extensive obligation, also the lord was bound to them by extensive obligation. No one in D.C. would argue that the medieval serfs or peasants were uh, slaves in the modern sense. They were free. The brutal institution of slavery essentially disappeared in Europe about the 10th century. Now, almost every historian agrees with this conclusion, but it remains incredibly fashionable to deny that the Catholic Church had anything to do with it. Let me quote a few of these historians. Robert Fossier. The progressive elimination of slavery was in no way the work of Christian people. The the church preached resignation, promised equality in the hereafter, and felt no compunction about keeping large herds of animals with human faces. Another historian, George Duby. He dismissed any church role in ending slavery, saying Christianity did not condemn slavery. It dealt it barely a glancing blow. Where are these people coming from? Well, according to these historians, slavery disappeared because it became unprofitable, an outdated mode of production. Even the Yale scholar Robert Lopez, he accepted this view, claiming that slavery only ended when technological progress, such as the water wheel, made slaves useless or unproductive. So in this view, from that perspective, and you hear a lot of that, and it's, pro- it's propagated through our our public school system, the end of slavery was not a moral decision, but one of self-interest on the part of the elite. By the way, that same argument is used concerning the abolition of slavery in the Western Hemisphere. See, both those claims, you see, are consistent with what? Marxism, Marxism doctrine. But they're quite inconsistent with true economic realities. Even as late as the start of the Civil War, we know here in this nation, southern slavery 
remained a profitable mode of production. It was very profitable. Because the fact of the matter is, slavery pays. If you can get more out of your slave than it costs for you to keep them, to care for them, to control them, if the profit is more, it's worthwhile. But it's, that is true. But what's equally true is that slaves are not nearly as productive as self-interested individuals performing the same task in pursuit of their own economic goals and interests. That is this. The owners benefit from the possession of slaves, but societies benefit far more from a free workforce. If you go back to ancient Rome, I alluded to the fact that Rome had a huge slave population. It did everything. Rome had a far stronger economy and army before the small independent farmers all around in the, uh, the countryside around Rome, before they were bought out, pushed out by the slave-based estates. The super elite of Rome had assumed all the power. That's why politically I'm a small government man because you study history and you see once the government assumes all power, they take over all things and all forms of production and that's what happened in Rome. Small elite, the small little group of senators, a few other wealthy times, they, they bought up all these farms. And the independence farmers, where'd they go? They didn't have a place to go because the farms were being worked by slaves. They came to the city. Now the government has a big problem because they've got to support all these other people. So you get into the bread and the circuses, and what's it do? It bankrupt Rome. And that's how it fell. But there was far more production when you have ownership of something. And you're working it and you're making your own profit. That's why Greece succeeded because they had city-states and people had ownership in their, prop uh, their property. And they were willing to work long hours because they were getting something out of it. And they were willing to fight for it because it was theirs. But once that begins to break down through slavery, everything kind of folds. Consequently, overcoming slavery gave Europe an incredible advantage over the rest of the world. That's why Western civilization became literally the, uh, the, uh, the place where all creativity flowed from. It's because it learned that uh, overcoming slavery gave it an economic uh, advantage over the rest of the world. But economics were not the decisive factor. Slavery ended in medieval Europe and the hereafter, only because of the influence and the teaching of the Catholic Church. And after centuries of this European decline, what happened? If you know your history, it once again would erupt. It erupted through the Islamic culture, who took slaves all the time. In fact, if you study history, the Battle of Oponto, one of the greatest famous sea battles, it was won by the Christians who were greatly outnumbered. The Ottoman Turks had the elite navy, outnumbered the Christians in a great way. But how the Christians won? Because they got on a ship and they took over one ship and the ship was filled with what? Christian slaves. Islam had imprisoned over a million Christians from Europe in all kinds of things, but they were the ones that were rowing the galleys. And every time they freed the ship, more got on their side, and they literally overwhelmed the other side, even though they were outnumbered. But the other things we know is the discovery of the New World, Spain and Portugal in particular. There was a huge resurrection of slavery again. It became a matter of great commerce to seize native people and carry them off to work on the plantations and the mines or elsewhere. Literally, slave trade became a worldwide industry were the sources for that brutal business founded in Africa and in the Americas itself. But the church continued to condemn the practice, even though some countries or peoples weren't listening. Okay. The Pope would issue a papal bull, but if you study history in the 15th century, the 16th century, the government, even though it was somewhat Catholic, they didn't allow the papal bull to get in there to be pronounced. 
They controlled everything. The church, uh, the government chose the bishops, the people that would be kind to them and nice to them. That was one of the problems the church got into because it, the government was stacking the church full of people that agreed with the government. So the church can speak, but the question is, will the people listen and will the countries listen? But let me tell you the ways the church spoke. Sixty years before Columbus discovered the New World, Pope Eugene IV condemned the enslavement of people in the newly colonized Canary Islands. He issued a papal bull called Sicut Ducum, and it rebuked European enslavers and commanded that all and each of the faithful of each sex within the space of 15 days of the publication of this papal bull in the place where they lived, that they were to restore, be restored to their earlier liberty. The Canary Islands who have been made subject to slavery, these people are to be totally and perpetually free and are to be let go without the exaction or reception of any money. A century later, in 1537, Pope Paul III applied the same principle to the newly encountered inhabitants of the West and South Indies. He issued a papal bull called Sublimis Deus in 1537. In response to the common enslavement of the Indians and the ruthless seizing of their territory, he excommunicated those people who took part in the slave trade among the Native Americans. He described that enslavers are allies of the devil and declared all attempts to justify such slavery null and void. And accompanying that papal bull was another document, Pastorali Officionum, which attached what? A laetate sententiae excommunicatione. That's the big excommunication. You have to go all the way to Rome to get that lifted. For anybody that would enslave the Native Americans or steal their property or their goods. The Jesuits in the Americas were feared and hated by the Spanish government and the Portuguese government because their efforts to do what? To protect the rights of the Native people. How many people saw that beautiful movie? It was back 20 years ago, The Mission. Did anybody see that? The story of the Jesuits that evangelized these indigenous natives of uh, kind of, it was in Bolivia, Brazil area. It's a magnificent movie. But... The Jesuits are undone by the government, literally had them suppressed, and they were also suppressed in Europe. Pope Urban VIII in 1639 condemned all forms of slavery, and it was common practice for popes and for some Christian princes and prelates to do what? Give their own money to per, uh, for the purpose, purchase of galley slaves to free them from their servitude. When the Europeans began enslaving the Africans as a cheap source of labor, the Holy Office of the Inquisition was asked about the morality of enslaving innocent blacks. The practice was rejected, as was the trading of such slaves. Slave owners, according to the Holy Office, declared were ob obliged to emancipate and compensate the blacks unjustly enslaved. So a lot of times you hear uh, uh, people will say, like historians, uh, that, oh, the church did nothing to ameliorate anything. That's not true. The church had what they called these black codes, slave codes. For example, in France in 1685. And what, what did that do? It did not, uh, it said they, that slaves couldn't gather in a public gathering, they couldn't have guns, okay. But on the other side of it, the owners were mandated to baptize, to catechize their slaves, to permit them to marry. They couldn't work on Sunday. They couldn't be tortured. They couldn't be served. There were very strong restrictions. Now, how many listened to it? But the fact of the matter is, where the Christian countries were, at least these codes were beginning the whole change of the attitude. In the Protestant ones, it was just the opposite. It was as horrific as, as the ancient times for these people. So when historians say, oh, the church did nothing, it did as best it could in the reality. Like we live in a reality where abortion is a legal right. We're working with all our effort, with all our intensity and all our prayer and mercy to save kids and to try to turn that thing around. But it's, it's a long, hard slog. Doesn't mean we don't believe it because it hasn't changed. It's just you got to keep working at things to change people's hearts. In the 19th century, uh, it was a particularly active period for the church against slave trade. Pope Gregory the, uh, the uh, excuse me, Pope Gregory the VI, in 1838, wrote to the bishops of Brazil to commend them on having at long last outlawed slavery. 
That same pope in 1839 issued a papal bull in Supremo. He reiterated again the papal opposition to enslaving Indians, blacks, or other such people, and he forbade any ecclesiastic or lay person from presuming to defend as permissible this trade in black slaves, no matter what the pretext or excuse. In 1888 and 1890, Pope Leo XIII forcefully condemned slavery and brought it its elimination where it persisted in still parts of South America and Africa. Of lasting importance, the founding of the Anti-Slavery League in France by Cardinal Le uh, Le Viguerier in 1890. He had a congregation called the White Fathers, the Missionaries of Africa. It labored long and hard and still does to end the practice of slavery. Now, some critics try to dismiss the church's role in uh, abolishing slavery by pointing to the fact that here in America there were some bishops and some clergy uh, and some theologians who tried to defend the American slave system. Remember, we can be as corrupt and get corrupted by our society. But those few bishops and priests and theologians, what they were trying to do, they were trying to contend that the long-standing standing papal condemnation of slavery, it didn't first apply to the United States. Not true. Then they said, well, the slave trade, uh, it was condemned by Pope Gregory, but not slavery itself. They were what were they doing? Mincing words, huh? The fact of the matter is the papal teaching consistently taught that slave trade and shadow slavery is evil. So, yes, certain members of the American hierarchy at the time tried to explain it away. According to Father uh, Panzer, we can look to this practice of non-compliance with the teachings of the papal magisterium as a key reason why slavery was not a directly opposed in the United States by the church. Other reasons were, if you remember in your history, there was a great anti-Catholic sentiment in the early times of the church, uh, early part of this nation. Persisted well into the 1800s. Terribly. Have you remember the nativist movement? Convents were raided because they were said that they were houses of prostitution. And uh, these things went on regularly. Churches were burned on a regular basis, Catholic churches. This kind of thing was going on. So sometimes the church lay low, and you can criticize people for not courage at times. But the fact of the matter is just because the church has said something doesn't mean it becomes a reality. The Second Vatican Council continued the consistent teaching of the church in condemning shadow slavery. It writes, whatever insults human dignity, such as subhuman living conditions, arbitrary imprisonment, deportation, slavery, the selling of women and children, as well as the disgraceful working conditions where men are treated as mere tools for profit rather than as free and responsible persons. All these things and others of their like are infamies indeed. They are a supreme dishonor to the Creator. Unfortunately, what Vatican II said about slavery is of little interest to the opponents of Catholicism insofar as they think it's only useful then to uh, demonstrate what they call Catholic hypocrisy. So when critics try to dismiss the authenticity of the church's teaching, the fact of the matter is uh, they do so from ignorance, prejudice, and a desire to discredit the church. The truth is the church was responsible. It took time, as we're taking time now to change a lot of immorality in our nation. It takes time to repudiate and to abolish evil institutions. She's constantly speaking and condemning the evils of the world. Sadly, Still, a lot of people don't listen. So for the sake of the world to say the early church approved and supported slavery and didn't get around to repudiating it until 1890s, well, it's just a myth and a lie. And that takes me to the second myth of today, tonight. And that's this. The Catholic Church is obsessed with sex, is anti-sex. Boy, the secular world is constantly espousing that myth. That the church is obsessed with sex or variations of the myths. The church is hung up about sex or is uptight about sex or is anti-sex. Brothers and sisters, hear this very clearly. The truth is the Catholic church and Catholics aren't the ones obsessed with sex. It's the secular media and the, and the modern progressives that are obsessed, obsessed about sex. For them, it's non-stop sex. You can't open a magazine, a newspaper, 
watch a television program, a TV commercial, a movie, or listen to some radio program without sex being thrown in somewhere. You know, 10 years ago, I was pastor down at Holy Family in Glendale, and it's not too far from DreamWorks, and I would be invited up as the pastor to uh, go there and and to talk to the people about some project they were going to do. But I was sitting down with a vice president of DreamWorks, and I turned to him and I said, can I ask you a question? What happened to all the wonderful storytellers that Hollywood used to have? I told really good stories. It seems to me that a great majority of your movies are simply remakes of good old stories and made bad in the remake. Or they are so poorly made that they're all just a conflation or a connecting of all kinds of fast chase scenes Super violence, and then, yes, you better be, see, be sure, out of the clear blue sky, for no reason whatsoever, whammo, a super erotic scene comes blasting across the stage and across the, uh, the, uh, the, the screen. I said, you know what that reminds me of, sir? I said, it reminds me of an old story I heard about a pastor who, after the Mass, sent the altar boy out to the pulpit to get his sermon. And the altar boy went up to the pulpit, and there was pages of the sermon, all neatly typed, a little underlined here and there. But on the edge of one of the pages, there was a handwritten note, and the little boy looked at it and said, Logic is weak here. Shout like hell. (laughs) Well, brothers and sisters, that's what so much of the media does. The logic, the storytelling, it's so weak that what do they do? They shout like hell to distract people, or to divert their attention, or to grab their attention. You know, our beloved Holy Father, Pope John Paul II, now St. John Paul II, when he came to California in 1987, how many remember his papal visit here? It's a wonderful visit. What a lot of people missed is that one of the gatherings was a gathering of all the people in the entertainment industry. And I'll just sum up basically what he said. He told them that their business and their art form, which he himself loved, he was a playwright. He was an actor. He loved their medium. But he said that their business and their art form could do so much to build up people and the society with noble stories, or their business could tear down people by appealing to the base nature of the human person. And he urged them to do the former, Unfortunately, they did the latter. You know, another point on this, have you ever noticed that the secular world, the unbelieving world, it loves the Catholic Church when it comes to all things social justice? What do I mean by that? They applaud us, they cheer us when we care for the sick and the poor, when you educate people with no expense to the society through our Catholic school system, we educate people, we educate the poor. I remember uh, 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 Cardinal uh, O'Connor in New York, God bless his soul, what a wonderful bishop there, but you know, all the public schools are complaining, well, we can't educate these people because of the breakdown of the family, and we have all these disadvantages. The Catholic Church gets the select students. You know what Cardinal O'Connor did? He called them on it. You give me your 10% worse students, and I guarantee you, I'll put them in my Catholic school, and I guarantee you, I will have them up to code, up to the level of reading. I'll have them good students. Because we know how to educate. And the world cheers us when we do that. It cheers us when we talk about fighting for the poor, and especially basic human rights, fighting against human trafficking, issues of immigration, the environment, the economy. War. It cheers us. But that same secular world absolutely goes unhinged when it comes to the church's belief and teaching about one topic sex. And all the issues connected to sex. What do I mean by that? Where does the Catholic Church get attacked on its teaching for of birth control, premarital sex? Cohabitation, extramarital sex, homosexual sex, gay marriage, abortion, 
in vitro fertilization and surrogate motherhood. In this one area and its satellites around it, this one area, the seculars go get unhinged. And they accuse the Catholic Church of these words. You hear it all the time. They're backwards, medieval, repressive, archaic, out of touch with the mainstream America. Let me give you a few examples about that. When the American bishops not too long ago spoke out sharply against the epidemic of pornography, a recent headline in the paper grumbled this way. Why are the Catholic bishops so obsessed with pelvic issues? Another incident, I don't know if you picked this up in the news about three weeks ago, involved a recent BBC production which highlighted the correspondence of Pope John Paul II, Saint Pope John Paul II, and a lovely woman named Anna Teresa uh, Timinika. She was a fellow Polish philosopher and a woman friend. The BBC production said they had discovered secret letters between Pope John Paul II and this beautiful uh, Polish woman, implying that there was something untoward, sinful in the relationship. The fact of the matter is the Pope's relationship and friendship with this woman was neither secret nor extraordinary. He had many dear friendships. You know, one of the first things that, if I remember correctly, what he did when he got named Pope, his dearest childhood friend was a Jewish family and a Jewish boy, and his parents had died in the, in the horrible uh, Holocaust. He had commissioned a beautiful headstone for the village from which he came, given to the family at his expense. He had many beautiful, deep friends with men and women. They just had a beautiful, wonderful friendship reflected in those letters. But the secular progressives of the world, they can't conceive of someone having a beautiful friendship with another person that isn't sexual. That's what's going on. And of course, I don't need to mention uh, how the media reacts to our current Holy Father, Pope Francis, and his remarks to the media. I don't remember uh, about a year and a year and some ago, the Pope was at World Youth Day in Brazil. And on his way home, do you remember this incident? He was asked about an incident. The incident was that a priest that he knew was accused of being involved in some homosexual activity. That was the presenting issue. And he had appointed him to a certain position. And the Pope's response was basically, who am I to judge a person who's trying to be a disciple of Jesus. In other words, he was talking about people can make mistakes, do the wrong thing, but they can repent as well. What did the media do? It ran with it saying the Pope was now endorsing homosexual sex and gay marriage. That's what the secular world does. The point I'm making with some of these examples is this. The, se- the secular world obsessively views so much of life through the lens of sex. When he hears a view different from what it believes, and it lives, it gets enraged and unhinged. And it races off with some statements that they didn't, uh, it races off with some statement that didn't understand, and they try to use it to literally, to promote uh, literally their agenda. That's what's happening. Excuse me. So, who's the one who's obsessed with sex? Brothers and sisters, it's not the Catholic Church. I'll tell you what the Catholic Church is obsessed with. She's obsessed with God. She's obsessed with the plan and the will of God. She's obsessed with God's love as it applies to us as humans. You see, by natural law and God's revelation, the Catholic Church knows that God created everything for a plan and a purpose. And when we use that thing according to its godly purpose, it becomes useful, beneficial, and a blessing. But when we don't use something for its proper purpose, guess what? It breaks. Much as you will break a pencil if you use it to try to open a can. It's not the purpose of a pencil. So the church is passionate about sex. Why? Because it's passionate about God's plan 
God's purpose for sex. He's not unclear about it. He's very clear. In the book of Genesis and all through the scripture and all through the tradition of our faith, but from the very beginning, when God was creating everything, we read about God's intention, huh? Genesis 1, 27, 28. God created man in his image. In the divine image, he created him. Male and female, he created him, them. And God blessed them, saying, Be fertile and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and all the living things that move on the earth. Genesis 2, 19 to 25. And then the Lord God built up into a woman the rib that he had taken from the man. And when he brought her to the man, the man said, This one at last is bone of my blown, flesh of my flesh. This one shall be called woman, for out of her man she has been taken. And that is why a man loves, leaves his father and mother and clings to his wife. And the two of them become one body. You see, in these two passages, we hear what? The two essential goals or purposes of marriage and marital love. The unitive, this is why a man leaves his father and mother and clings to his wife, and the two of them become one, the unitive goal. And then the procreative goal, procreation. God created him in his image and likeness. God blessed them, saying, be fertile and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. So from natural law, seeing how things just work naturally, deserve the world around us, and from divine revelation, the Catholic Church knows that God designed sex for a man and a woman in a committed, for the rest of your life covenant, one that is forever faithful, permanent, and life-giving, not just to each spouse, that's a unitive, but also to have children to be raised in the environment, in that home, where they experience literally the embrace of God through the embrace of a mom and dad. And when a husband and wife in marriage share the gift of sexuality with each other, keeping those two purposes together in the sexual act, do you know what the church teaches, brothers and sisters? It teaches that it is a prayer. It sanctifies the couple. Isn't that incredible? Isn't that beautiful? You make holy your spouse through the selfless gift of all that you are as you wash dishes and clothes and do all that stuff and... Take care of kids. But it all culminates in that beautiful act where one gives one, uh, themselves to the other. It is literally a prayer. You sanctify each other. Is that far different than the view of our world that treats it just as some kind of animalistic act? When sex is shared outside that vision without those two goals or purposes, the church says it's wrong, it's sinful. It breaks. You know, when I was, uh, as an associate, I was in charge of the youth ministry, and a lot of the youth would come up to me, you know, the guys especially, you know, Father, I mean, why is it wrong for me to have sex with my girlfriend? And sometimes a girl would say my boyfriend. You know, we love each other. We care about each other. We're not hurting anyone. What could be so wrong that feels uh, so good? Well, I tell them that, uh, look... You don't determine whether something is good or bad, right or wrong, just by looking at it or how it feels. You determine something's right or wrong, good or bad, by asking the fundamental question, what's the purpose of it? If it fulfills the purpose, then it's good. If it doesn't, then it's bad. I'll give you an example. This wristwatch. Is this watch good or bad? Well, what's the fundamental question? Does it tell time? Yeah. Yeah. If it, yeah, I think I'm, I'm on target. I got 15 more minutes. If, it's, if it tells time, then it, it's good. If it doesn't, then it's bad. You discard it or you get it fixed. Another way of looking at it is body language. Referencing Pope John Paul II's beautiful uh, theology, the body. As humans, what are we? We are embodied souls. Our soul expresses itself through the incarnational reality of our bodies. Our soul has body language. You know, we know when someone's mad at us, and we know it because of the body language. You know, they turn their back on us, down, or, you know. There's a body language. Or there's a silent treatment, huh? You know, you heard the expression, you you can't trust that person because he lies through his teeth. Well, when sex is misused, what are you doing? You're lying through your whole body. 
you're doing something that is not according to the purpose and plan of God. The church knows the plan and purpose of everything. That's why she speaks with God authority about the morality of everything, whether it's personal behavior or the economy or business dealings or the environment or people's human rights, the protection of the poor and the most vulnerable in our society. Again, the secular world shares that part of it. We're really correct in all that. We're infallible in all that. But when the church speaks about the same divine authority, about the gift of sexuality as purpose, a purpose she knows so well, the world goes crazy and attacks the church as being out of touch and unreal. Brothers and sisters, the Catholic Church is the one institution that is most in touch with reality and the one that is most real and the one who tells the truth about sex. You know, I often tell people, you know, when they ask me, where were you born? I said, well, I was born in Van Nuys, California. But, you know, even though I was born in Van Nuys, California, when it comes to uh, telling the truth about things, I'm a man from Missouri. And Missouri, the nickname is, it's the show me state, huh? So when it comes to statistical evidence and observing things, I'm a man from Missouri. Let's see who's telling the truth about sex. The church or the world? If the world is right about sex... Namely, that there should be no limits to sex, that one should be able to do what one feels or desires, that one should be able to have sex with anyone a person wants, that there's nothing wrong or harmful about sex, no matter how it's shared and with whom it's shared. Then, brothers and sisters, we should see the obvious evidence of that truth. People should be happier, marriages should be stronger, families should be holding together, more united, the world should be more peaceful. Brothers and sisters, honestly... I don't see it. I don't see it. I don't think you see it. It's just the opposite. But if the church is right, as I believe with my every fiber in my being, then we should see the evidence. And brothers and sisters, the evidence is there. It's the communion of saints. It's the so many wonderful, fabulous marriages that have served as the building block of the church and the kingdom of God. So when the secular world says the church is obsessed with sex, I say, it's more accurate to say, we're not obsessed with sex. We're obsessed with true love, true life, and finding the eternal beauty of God himself that God has revealed through all of Revelation, the scripture and tradition. And we see it. Remember St. Paul's words, those cogent words in 1 Corinthians 6? The body is not for immorality, but it's for the Lord. Your bodies belong to Christ. Avoid all immorality. Your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. So glorify your, the Lord in your body. Listen to that. That biblical teaching on sexual morality, it's so positive. It's so liberating, so healthy, so happy and wholesome. As the Bible reveals, and as St. Paul elaborates, as philosophers and poets and sage men and wise women of the past and present remind us, as our own experience tells us, as the ingrained promptings of the natural law nudge us, and as a church constantly in our tradition passes on to us, sexual love is so sacred, so noble, so awesome, that it actually reflects what? God's personal, passionate love for us. If you ever go to the Prado in Spain, the beautiful museum of art there, Murillo has a magnificent painting there. It's called The Double Trinity. It's a beautiful painting. It shows God the Father, the Holy Spirit, and the child Jesus here, flanked by Mary and Joseph. And the way he arranges the figures They form two triangles, a double trinity. But the point is obvious. You see, what goes on in heaven, as we pray in the Our Father, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What's going on in heaven? The Father loves the Son so perfectly, so completely, so divinely. And the Son returns that love so perfectly, so divinely. Their union is so perfect It's the thirdness of the Trinity, the third person, the Holy Spirit. And that's reflected what? In marriage. As the husband loves the wife and the wife loves the husband. So generously, so generously, so perfectly, so divinely. The thirdness is what? It's children. See, it's reflected in that. So human sexual love should have the same traits as divine love. That means 
It is forever. It's faithful. It's life-giving. <clears throat> so the creator intends that sexual love does what? It takes place only within the lifelong, creative, exclusive, loving bond of a man and woman in the unique relationship that we call marriage. Is the church really concerned about sex? And does she speak, street, speak strongly and clearly about it? Absolutely. The Catholic Church and Catholics, they care about sex because why? Because we care about people. Sex is not only a, a, a pleasure. It's not only where children come from. Certainly we are concerned about children. But sex is also where we learn how to love properly and fully or not at all. We're concerned about love because love, brothers and sisters, we know from Paul's letter to the Corinthians, it's the greatest and most important gift of all, of, of God's gift to us. It's the most important thing, though, we need to learn and how to do in this world. It's like this. We all come into life inheriting original sin and the wound, a gaping wound called what I call, and some other theologians call the love wound. It's a result of original sin. We feel we're not loved enough and we don't know properly how to love others. And through life, what do we do? We attempt to love and end up being more deeply wounded. We wound and, and we're wounded further. We mess up in love. We make mistakes. We hurt and we get hurt. Furthermore, learning to love other people is also about learning to love ourselves. Love your neighbor as yourself. And you know what? We're human beings and we mess up there too. And our sexual activity is all tied up with our attempts to find true and lasting love. Unfortunately, it tends to go the other way, in the wrong direction, against the plan of God. That's why people sleep around, they look at porn, get involved with nasty stuff, they dabble about in sex. Because why? They and all, a lot of people are trying to learn what? The deeper reality, how to love. And we learn that all sex has not helped us to really learn how to love. See, if the world's right, then we should experience this incredible love, but it's not going in that direction. It's really hindered our attempts to find true love. As a result, we are even more deeply wounded, and what do we do? We pull back into our shell, into that love-lorn life, our own eternal loneliness. The Catholic Church, building on 2,000 years of wisdom and experience, says this tenderly. This love business, it's difficult. It's a great adventure. You require a map and a guide and a mentor. It's a lifelong quest. Learning to really love is not easy and it's not a quick accomplishment. And that's why you need to make just one commitment to just one person for the whole of your life together so that one man and one woman can embark on this great adventure together. And maybe, just maybe, you will make it to the end and after a lifetime of self-sacrifice, you'll cross the finish line and be able to hold up your heads and your hands and say, we did it. We did it. We learned how to love. Why is that so important? Because this is what it means to be truly human. To be truly human. To learn how to love another person is the great adventure. And that's why God put us in this world. That's why he sent his son. That's why he died to pay for it, to open up again the heart of God so it could pour out in us. Why is this so important? Because he learned how to, lo to, to learn how to love is also to learn how to penetrate the heart of God who himself is love. You know, one of my favorite musicals, it is my favorite, Les Miserables, but I'm especially moved, everything comes to that one line, to love another person is to what? Is to see the face of God. You see, brothers and sisters, that's why the Catholic Church and Catholics are obsessed with sex. Because what we do with our private parts is connected with what? It's learning how to love in creativity, faithfulness, purity, and truth. This is the sacred, precious, and beautiful human journey. It is a treasure that is eternal and a beauty that lasts forever. Cheap sex treats it like trash. Cheap and trashy sex is to true love what a plastic cup is to an ancient Chinese vase. Cheap sex, you see, treats people like a plastic cup, something that's so easily used, crushed, and thrown away. 
So, brothers and sisters, you see, it is a lie and a myth when the secular world shouts out, church is just obsessed with sex. The church is hung up on sex. It's uptight about sex. It's anti-sex. Uh-uh. The church isn't obsessed with sex. The modern media, the secular progressives, they're the ones obsessed with sex. For them, it's nonstop, uninhibited, constant sex with no promise and no uh, production of good. As I said before, I'll tell you what the Catholic Church is really obsessed about. She is, has and always will be, will be obsessed with God, with God's will, with his plan, and with his God's love as it touches our lives. Amen. 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 God bless you.